Right, welcome ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with Bo, or Bo is here with me, and we're going to be doing a big deep dive, the the Dune Mega Review, or Dune, Dune, Dune Mega Review, uh, all things Dune, basically. So, yeah, let's get into it, I guess. From, from the books to the movies, where do you want to start? Or the yeah, inspiration I've... behind the books? Yeah, I've been. Uh, I've got a lot to say about this. It's one of my favourite things. Yeah, I thought we could talk about. Obviously, June two has just come out for anyone that's watching yeah. this years down the line on the old internet. June two has just come out in the uh, in the spring of twenty twenty four, and uh, so yeah, I'd love to talk about Frank Herbert and the original novel. Uh, maybe we could talk touch at least on the David Lynch nineteen eighty four version, and then the two the two Denis Villeneuve or Denis Villeneuve vi films. Uh, yes, and just talk all yeah. about it. I also want to mention here or there uh, Lawrence of Arabia or Seven Pillars of Wisdom, because I think mm. there's many layers to this we can talk about. There's obviously the original thing, the Frank Herbert novel. Then there's mm. the movies. Um, but I, uh, but there'll be lots of people, or there are already lots of people that have done reviews on all that sort of thing. I'd like to add, if I can, a, a, another layer, layers within layers, uh, and talk about talk about seven pillars of wisdom as well but yeah i mean where do you want to start well so i i i watched dune uh part two a little bit before you didn't i and then you watched it i think you watched it about a, a week after i had um yeah which is still I, a couple of weeks ago now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um I, what i think let, i mean let's start with let, let's start with the, the the two new movies and sort of a, a broad review of them and then go to the books and you know you have to forgive me long time my my knowledge on the books are not not great at the moment so i'm going to let you sort of do the heavy lift in there um but what did you think what did you think of dune part 2 i thought it was absolutely brilliant now i'm actually quite a harsh critic i don't say that about many things ever in fact in the last few years good few years the only things i can say on tv or film that i've genuinely thought was superb sort of blown over by is june one and june two um mm. chernobyl i don't know if you saw that tv series chernobyl yeah i thought that was superb i've rewatched that about five times um and also to a slightly lesser extent but still thought was absolutely superb was blade runner 2049 which is also villeneuve isn't it okay yeah, yeah, it is. yeah, uh, and they're yeah. the only things that I've, I've, I've really thought were, were bordering on masterful. And as for June, uh, June one and two, I really like them. But this is one of one of the things I would say is that there's a special place in my heart for the original novel. Mm. And I first read it. I've read it four times now, and I reread it in the last couple of weeks for this. I first read it when I was about Paul's age. Well, I was about sixteen or seventeen. And Paul's mm. 15 when the book opens. He's about 18 by the end of the book. So it's about his age. And I didn't even get it all, really. I reread it again when I was in my, must have been mid to late 20s and really got it quite a lot more at that point. And I reread it again in my early 30s. And um, like I say, for the fourth time now in the last couple of weeks. And so it's sort of got a special place in my heart. As I say, it's for me, it's the best sci-fi universe. It's better mm. than... The Warhammer 40k universe is better than the Star Wars universe. I've read quite a lot of sci-fi. It's it's the best universe for me. Uh, so, yeah. so oh, one other thing I'd say uh, before you go um, is to say that I've I've read lots of books and then they make a film out of it and then you watch the film. That nearly always works for me, even if the screenwriter and the film have butchered the book. That's great. The other way around never works for me. I've only had it a few times where I've seen the film. Then I've tried to read the book. That that never works. It's really crap. It's really crap when you do that. Um, that's, an in uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, for that's me, cool. anyway, uh, it never, ever works. Uh, but the other way around is great. So even, as I say, even the uh, David Lynch version, I still quite liked it. And one mm. last thing I would say uh, about this is that I implore anyone out there that hasn't yet seen June 1 or June 2, read the first novel first, if you can. It's not that short of a novel, but it's a page turner. It's easy enough to read, mm -hmm. even, even if it's a bit confusing, but it's a page turner. Read the book first, then see the movies, because it will be so much richer. They already 
as standalone movies, brilliant. Mm. If you've read the book, there's something like magical. Well, that's my opinion anyway. What What do you think? Uh, yeah, what? Well, that, I mean, that's interesting because so. Oh, I guess there's there's going to be a, a fair amount of jumping around, I guess, in this discussion, isn't there? Because that you know, just a, a broad stroke opinion of of the movies there and a little bit of the book, but but it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people, there's a lot of chatter saying uh, some of the changes with respect to uh, Dune Part Two, um, sort of motivational, you know, motivational characters, Cheney, Tranny. Um, some people didn't like stuff like that. So should we should we talk about some of the changes mm. and then sort of, sort of address that? And because it's interesting to say that you, I mean, m- my opinion of Doom, I loved Doom Part Two. I thought it was a great film. It was an absolute superb film. I really liked Dune. I thought Dune Dune Part One was a good film. I thought it was decent, beautifully shot, technically mm. superb, great. There were some things which were lacking here and there. Like the music, for instance, Dune Part One. I thought the I thought the score was a little bit lackluster, um, which I know people disagree on. I'm you know I'm not uh, blind to that, and I do feel people's you know people say it didn't feel like a complete film. It wasn't like it was literally not a complete film. So some of the detractor elements of the film are not actually its fault because it's part of how they're adapting a a bigger story. Um, but I really liked it. That all all that said. And then they build on it with Doom Part 2. Doom Part 2 is is exponentially better in every single way. The score was superb. So beautifully done. It, everything worked for me. Everything worked for me in that film. Um, I don't think, because again, it's been a few weeks now since I've watched it, I don't think there was anything that I personally pulled up as, oh, I didn't really like this or... It, or it all just sort of worked. It all culminated um, in a great sci-fi experience, which, you know, is so rare today in the sort of caped crusader world that we have in theatres nowadays. It was so nice to sit there and get truly lost in a world for quite a while mm. because you do get lost in it and it's so immersive and so unlike anything that we have. And you're also asked as the audience, just go along with it. You know, it's not, you're not spoon fed. It's, this is the world we're here. Enjoy it. You're here for the ride. Uh, and what a ride it was doing part two. Mm. Brilliant. Great film. Really, really good. Yeah. So obviously the, the, sort of the cinematography kind of, obviously it looks brilliant, really, really, really good. I mean, among the mm. best I've seen in a long time, perhaps, perhaps ever, I don't want to over gild the lily, but it looks very, 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 very good. Um, the score, do you know what? I'm one of those people that I'm afraid don't really pay that much attention to a score. If it's, if it's blindingly good, I'll notice it. Otherwise Mm -hmm. it's just one of those things. I'm I'm much more interested in story, plot, narrative, uh, dialogue, acting, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, still it stood out. It was Zimmer, wasn't it? Isn't it? It's, uh, no, uh, I think it was uh, Bjorn, Bjorn Jorgensen, I think. I might have been Zimmer. It's one of the two. Anyway, so, the, the, the score was good. It sort of did. I did sort of notice it for being good. Um, but yeah, as for it being immersive, so so June one and June two, the films are just the first novel. There are many many novels in the in the June saga, um, and so the first two of these films, I think there's going to be a third one. The first two films are just the first novel. Okay, now, mm. um, and it reflects the novel very very accurately, almost scene for scene. But they do chop it around and change it a bit, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the book starts off quite slow. There's not, there's no action really for like the first third maybe of the book, and and June one is about the first third of the book. It's not half and half. It's not fifty fifty. Mm. Um, so the fact that June one is a lot slower in pace and in all sorts of respects, it's slow. It's quite a slow film. Now I was already on board, uh, being a, a, a June fan already, so that didn't bother me. But if you come to it cold and you're expecting some sort of high octane action filled thing you're not really going to get that much for june one uh, but now, now june two uh, just like the novel um is much more action-packed um and uh, uh and so that yeah there's a lot more to it and they had to fit a lot more in i mean it's not a short film june two is it or was it like two mm. hours 40 odd something like that uh, yeah, it, it whizzed by for me it whizzed by for me now I'll say a few words about what they changed um 
yeah, I'll say, well, things off the top of my mind. I hope, let's say, I watched it about two weeks ago now, roughly. And so I hope I can remember the things they changed. Uh, well, the big one is that in the book, um, um, is it Aaliyah, um, Paul's little sister, is mm. born, is born in the book. Um, and she takes part in and is and grows up super quickly, like ma almost magically quickly, superhumanly yeah. quickly. She grows up, um, and so she actually takes part in events at the end by the end of the story. Um, and in the film, she's still unborn. Also, there's a uh, there's a big jump in time about two thirds of the way through the first novel. Um, it just it just skips ahead about three years. Paul's supposed to be fifteen. They say a number of times he's fifteen. And then about, as I say, about two thirds of the way through the book, he's sort of suddenly 18. And they mention that three years have passed. In the film, they don't do that. It's it's supposed to, the whole film takes place over just a few months. You're given the impression, mm. something like that, at most. Uh, so they're the big things. A few other things. There's a few characters they miss out, like the Count Fenring. You don't see the Count Fenring. You see his wife in it that Fade Ruffer sleeps with, which is also isn't in the novel. Um, Austin Butler sleeps with her, apparently. That's None of that's in the novel. Um, Oh, oh, the uh, the Beast Raban, um, Big Big Dave Batista. You don't see his death in the novel. It, it mm. takes place off screen or off page, so to speak. It's just mentioned that he's been killed. Whereas they actually show you it. They show Gurney Halleck killing him in the film. So that's that's different. Uh, well, other, there's another big character, uh, the the Baron Harkonnen's uh, Mentat, um, uh, Piter by uh, Piter de Vries. Um, he's a great character, really brilliant character, really, really horrible and evil um, in the novel, which just isn't it's in. Appeared. I don't think, he, is he in June 1? I don't think you see him in he June is. 1. Oh, yeah, you he's do? in June 1. Oh, yeah. yeah, you do. It's been and about sort of years gone. seen June 1, I'm afraid. But yeah, his death. They show you his death mm. and stuff. I can't remember his that in June 1. It's been, I should have I should have rewatched June 1. But I watched June, June 1 twice. But both about a year ago now or so, I think it must have been. Yeah, he's he's about. only, in Dune, in Dune 1, he's only shown... I think he's shown in like two scenes um, in Dune One, but then in Dune Dune Two, he's just gone. Like he's not shown. The Mentats on a whole are actually just entirely left out. They're just mm -hmm. not there, mm -hmm. which is uh, I don't know. A creative a, choice, maybe. I suppose so. Yeah, I suppose for, screenwriting is a whole different thing to novel writing, and I don't know mm -hmm. the secrets or the magic to what makes a good screenplay. But uh, the screenplay was still brilliant i think like i say once i've read the novel and i know the novel i know that what the original thing is i don't mm. mind that much if a screenwriter buggers about with it as long as they're not you know really taking the mickey which i don't think they are in this is in most respects it's very very faithful to the original novel what other quick things um there's um uh, well that you see a big scene on gd prime don't you the harkin and homeworld there's like well, a whole section mm. of the film on gd prime and yeah. you see fade ruther in the in the fighting arena that's only mentioned in the novel almost in passing it's mentioned a couple of times there's not a big long descriptive scenes of it or anything like that in the novel mm. so that's that's different um a couple other quick things uh well, well there's a lot in the novel which they can't really put on screen unless you're just going to have massive amounts of voiceover or something or massive amounts of sort of crowbar in exposition it's a really deep complicated story the novel and they just can't with the best will in the world with the best storytellers mm -hmm. and lots and lots of time at their disposal they can't put it all in a movie uh but they still do a, a very good job of it i i think um oh, oh duncan idaho is quite a big character in the novel and uh, i think you see him or he's mentioned you do see him yeah he's that that merman guy you see him yeah. in june one for a bit what's his name what's the actor's name he's very famous uh actor's jason name. momoa yeah, yeah yeah he's duncan idaho he's, not... he's a really big character in the novel and not in the film really um yeah. They're the main big things. I'll probably think of other things as we go along. Well, so, so uh, navigators. They're yeah, yeah. The guild. Yeah, now the guild plays a big part in the first novel. The guild is referenced and mentioned quite a lot, but they never explain it. That's left for later novels. Uh, mm. But yeah, also the Chome Company. So the Spacing Guild, or just the Guild, are in charge of all space flight, all space travel. They've got a monopoly on that. Mm. And then there's a Ch the Chome Company. Um, which are sort of in charge of all sort of commerce and the, and and business and banking and um, the, the actual the, the the business of the dealing in spice. Um, mm. And again, in the first novel, then it's not really all explained very much at all. Um, but they're there, and it's not really. I don't think it's really mentioned in the films hardly at all, is it? Um, 
No, I don't think they get a mention at all, actually. Mm. Uh, I'd have to... No, I I don't think they're mentioned. No, no, I don't think they're mentioned. There's too many layers. It's already a complicated... The films, it's already quite packed in and quite quite complex. So they've obviously made the decision to sort of not overcomplicate it. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, from from a, a writing perspective, I think that's smart because they're, you know, y- you are dealing with quite a lot. It, it's, from a filmmaking perspective, it, it's where do you put your primary focus on narrative-wise? So I think that makes sense in terms of the changes that they did. Um, or at least, you know, not mentioning certain bits and pieces. I think it makes sense from a narrative perspective because people just go, well, what's that then? And then it wouldn't really come back up again but it would obviously, you know, in a series of books and things like that, it pops back up a little bit quicker. So, mm. you know, movies, obviously, with the length of time to be made, even if they do get made, sequels and stuff. So, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think it, it's interesting, isn't it, that they chose to do the inverse or the, or the direct opposite uh, of what they do in the novel with respect to his little sister. Right, you know, doing part two, just that's just not born, just nah, just mm. communicating from beyond the womb, and then, in, <laughs> and then in, the, in the novel, grows up really quickly. Like it's like it, that, that. I think that was an interesting choice. I wonder why. I wonder mm. what what sort of thoughts you have that they went around doing. Uh, any any thoughts on that? Uh, sort of yeah, I mean, why? Yeah, I think it must be simply because it would it would make things overly complicated. Because, the, the, I mean, they hint at it. But Jessica, the Lady Jessica, um, uh, played by uh, the delicious Rebecca Ferguson, I'm absolutely in love with her. I think she's beautiful. Uh, she has there's a great there's a great thread through the novel about how she can communicate with Aaliyah in the womb, all to do with the waters of mm. life. And then Paul, once he gets his prescience, he can communicate with her before she's born. And then even after she's born, they've got some sort of uh, telepathy going on with each other uh, i mean mm. so in the bigger story of june she plays a massive part i mean she she she's saint alia of the knife um she plays a massive role I, I won't bother talking about what happens in the second and third novels and onwards because it's just it's sort of too big <laughs> sort mm. of <laughs> it's sort of too mind-numbingly big um but yeah i think it must have been the whole alia thing uh, it, was, it must have been just a conscious decision not to overcomplicate things because she's in the um, uh, the Lynch 1984 version, isn't she? You see yeah. her in that, and she's yeah, in that yeah. and everything. Um, but yeah, where Paul Paul's character and Paul's ability to sort of see through time and all that sort of thing, it, that's already complicated. Then they already struggled to sort of show that. So to I throw a lead they... there as well, it yeah. would have been. I, I I think they did a relatively good job actually at establishing um, Paul's Paul's sort of uh, abilities in a way which didn't seem sort of campy, you know, and sort of a bit cliche. I think they did a relatively good job because, I, I, you know, from a, from an artistic perspective, creatively, that they're, they're also trying to skirt around being referenced to you know superhero abilities as well. Because if that's the norm in in, in theatres at the moment it would be what immediately generally would come to mind um or Mm -hmm. star wars i guess Mm -hmm. um and i think they did a really good job of of establishing his sort of abilities and 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 the like uh without it coming across cheesy i think i think they managed to do everything to be fair um what did you say here's a question what, what did sorry, you think of... sorry just one quick thing to say about Aaliyah oh, is yeah, you yeah. do see her in one of his sort of dreamlike states when she's grown up there's one bit do you remember mm. he's having yeah. some sort of dream and it, there's there's oceans on oh, June and she's grown up mm. she's grown up and you see her sort of elfin face on screen very yes, very Annie, briefly uh, played by Anya Taylor Anya Taylor Joy mm. Mm. Yeah, so I think, it's, I think, it's yeah. mentioned. Sorry, sorry, you was going to ask me a specific question. Yeah, so I was, I was going to say, what, what what did you think of Baron Harkonnen and I guess the the sort of subtleties they went around his grotesqueness because mm. you know you know what he is in the novel and what he is um, for those that have watched it in in sort of the eighty four movie as well is very very much 
like the most evil type of gross person there is. <laughs> um, it's a direct, I mean, the direct references to, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, to be fair. Doing doing gross things, degenerate things mm, with uh, yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to phrase so, it way. So in these uh, 2020 films, it's Stellan oh. Star- Skarsgård, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, brilliant, brilliant actor. He's actually in, in Chernobyl as well. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant actor. No one, no one would mm. doubt that for a moment. He plays the Baron superbly, in my opinion. Uh, and so, yeah, in the book, he is described as sort of one of the most disgusting humans it's sort of possible to be. Really, really fat, but also just ugly and really, really gross in every way physically. And then, like, uh, and just as a person, um, a, a, like a terrible, terrible, sadistic psychopath type. And um, just to say, it's some sort of, uh, well, a, 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 a paedophile, a pederast. It seems yeah, like he likes I, little boys. It, that, it, that's it, what it, I, was, I, was, I was skirting around that. <laughs> there's no, it's not, it, um, uh, Herbert never says it as, as explicitly as that, but it's, it's, mm. um, Noted once or twice that he's got a predilection for for pretty boys. Now, back in the sixties when it was written, you know, you probably couldn't get away with that now because people say, well, "Well, what's wrong with that?" Or you know, stop judging. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but, that's my yeah, modern any, day. <laughs> anyone that's normal obviously knows that is uh, is is perverse and sort of yeah. morally wrong. And so Frank Herbert wrote that into the original thing. Uh, there is one bit actually in June two where. Um, Fade Ruffer, or, or is it uh, uh, Raban, comes into the, I think it's Fade Ruffer, he comes into the Baron's chamber and there's just sort mm. of two dead bodies in the corner. Yes. And it it yeah, doesn't really mention yeah. it. But that is in the book a few times that um, the Baron and the Nar Baron, Fade Ruffer, as just part of their like evening's entertainment, they'll just sort of have their way with a few slaves and kill them, murder them. And that's their fun. That's their evening. That's that's how that's sort of how dark and horrible they're supposed to be. Mm. Um, and then throw on top of that for the Baron himself that he's uh, sort of pitiless um, and, as mm. I say, sadistic. Like genuinely loves to hurt people e- emotionally mm. and physically. Uh, so he's just sort of an arch arch baddie. And as bad as yeah. he is, you know, sort of Darth Vader bad. Um, it's sort of it's never really over the top. You sort of buy into it. It's not sort of comic book bad, where you're like, oh really? Oh, he's murdered a million people. Yeah. No, it's like it's sort of real. Uh, you know, you, you buy into the realistic nastiness of him, and uh, also that idea of uh, plans within plans within plans that he mm. that the Baron's capable of. In the book, it says something like um, a masterpiece of revenge, or uh, um, something like that. That he's very very calculating. And um, yeah, St- Stan Skarsgård does a, a great job of it. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, the descriptions in the novel go on and on and on. It's interesting. So having having just watched the 84 version up until about three quarters of the way, um, it's all I had time for uh, today. But it is interesting, the, the, the sort of depiction of the Baron uh, in the 84 version, it's... It, it's... It's definitely of its time. I mean, the the sort of big floating gas suit and things like that. It's definitely of its time. Mm. Um, But they, I mean, the the, the sort of pedophilia aspect um, and his uh, sort of sadistic uh, sort of sexual gratuity that he gets out of murdering people um, is really explicit and quite disgusting. Um, and don't they and, show and him I'm, if memory serves? Don't they show him physically diseased and sort of corruption on his face and stuff, which they yes, don't so do they, in they don't do with Stellan, do they? No. Sorry. So, so that that's one of the one of the first introductions to the Baron is he's sat in a room. I think they did a really good job actually of uh, Harkonnens. It's, it's uh, Gidi Prime, Gidi uh, Gidi Gidi Prime, isn't it? Um, they did a really good job of showing that i think actually in the 84 version again it's of its time great uh, sort of practical sets and things like that and you know miniatures um but really really good like very industrious very industrial um and then again contrast that to what they showed in the the modern modern day modern day 
um, Dune. It's interesting where the sort of artistic elements went, but I think both work one of its time, one more sort of sci-fi aspect. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, going back to the, that is the first introduction is he's in this room and he's got these doctors around him. One's working on him and sort of almost injecting him. It looks like they're injecting him with sort of disease and things like that because he's sort of pumping a syringe and I don't know if it's, I don't know, it might be pulling stuff out, might be putting stuff in with it because it's the Baron, you know, logic would be probably putting stuff in to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, really gross, big pustules, big mm, sort of, mm. you know, holes in his flesh and real nasty, real, real nasty. Uh, but then, yeah, it, subsequently in that scene, because Fade and Raban, uh, you know, that's their introduction into that scene as well in the movie. And then, he sees that he sees a pretty boy uh, that's that's bringing flowers to this room, which is I always thought that was a bit odd, you know, Giddy Prime and there's flowers there. It didn't really add up to me, but never mind. Mm-hmm. And then he floats over to this guy, and because that that's the thing that they have in that movie, they got heart plugs, which isn't that's not in the um, the novel, the sort mm-hmm. of way to to murder people randomly. Mm-hmm. There's just these heart plugs. Mm-hmm. So he pop this heart plug out and then in, sort of indulges this sort of sexual gratuitous element of this uh, little boy's death. Really quite gross. Mm. But um, yeah, interesting. But it's uh, point point of saying it is it, it's fascinating to see the two comparisons. One, you know, modern day now and then the sort of one back in 84. But they both mm. work. But they're mm. both different facets to it. So Skarsgård mm. does a really mm. good, cold, calculating, very, very, almost meticulously planned all of these events. Um, really sort of, you know, a tactician. You know, he's he's, mm. he's a strategist. You know, sort mm. of got all of this thing, this whole thing laid out before him. He knows what he's doing uh, and very evil with it, a commanding power. And then this other one in the 84, it's almost like a mad power. You know, people are <laughs> indulging in his fantasies because they're just like, oh, my God, what what is this guy going to do next? But they both actually work, I guess, in, in the mm. regard of an adaptation from the <clears throat> novel because they're seemingly facets of the same character that born them out. Um, that, that would be, uh, that'd be yeah, my, my sort of uh, observation there. I don't know, because well, a while since you watched it. so Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I've seen it a couple of times. Um, and so one of the things... The 80s version has got a bit of a reputation for being uh, really bad or people that love the novel were like really, really upset by the 80s version because, well, for apart from anything else, uh, Carl McLaughlin is way too old to be Paul. He's like 30 or something stupid. Uh, Paul's supposed to be a boy and not just a boy. He's supposed to be look young for his age. People are surprised that he's 15. He's 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 he's, he looks small and young for a 15 year old. Mm. So, so that's what Paul is supposed to be, at least at the beginning. Um, so that's sort of uh, cast poorly. And then there's loads of things that, loads of things that they miss out and don't explain in the 80s version, where if you didn't know the novel, it just wouldn't make any sense. It just wouldn't mm. hardly make any sense, especially the last third of it or so, which is which is a fair enough criticism. However, I, also, I still think there are loads of good things in the 80s one, loads of really, really good things about it. Um, but there's one thing I'll say, one last thing I suppose to say about the Baron, his depiction, is that again, nowadays you would call it fat shaming or, or, or ableism <laughs> or something. The idea that if you're disgustingly obese, that that, that reflects directly that something morally wrong with you. Uh, right? <laughs> right. If you're so fat that you need um, like special, special levitator things in order to move around or like um, a, a mobility scooter, if you need that, then, oh. then in your inner core, you're you're wrong, <laughs> you're evil. You're, there's something black and wrong with you. You know, like again, oh. it's quite of its time, quite sixties thing to you know. No one would blink an eye at that back back yeah. in the day. But nowadays, it's a bit less uh, oh, okay hilarious. to do that. But you know, that's what it is. You know, that's that mm-hmm. is what it is. A um, couple of things I would say about um, so I'd like to get my criticisms out of the way because I've got one or two small ones. Yeah. Um, uh, so if we get that out of the way, and then I can just gush endlessly about everything else. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say, before I get to my criticism, some of the other criticisms I've seen like on Twitter and stuff 
Um, Are we talking about Doom Part 2? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which I don't yeah, think is okay. fair. Yeah. Um, one big one I saw um, uh, was that there's this there's this idea that all the baddies are white, sort of porcelain white, and, <laughs> and, and all the goodies you're supposed to root for are, are brown people. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. Right, I, guess, yeah. I, I just think I, I just think that's nonsense. I saw a very mm. someone I highly respect, um, Tom Rosell, survived the drive. Uh, I highly, highly respect that man. Mm. I, 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 I'm privileged uh, that I've had a conversation or two with him. But that was his, one of his, that was basically his take on Twitter. Now I feel that's completely unfair. That's uh, the story is so much more than that. It, well, it's so much bigger and deeper and rich and complex well, that to reduce it to that, or that you hate Timothy Chalamet, that he's that in real life the actor Tim, Timothy Chalamet is like some sort of like uh, globo homo sort of weirdo <laughs> queen type freak dude, and yeah, because he's a, he's a bit of a metrosexual, yeah, let's call it that. Uh, but, and so that ruins the whole film for you. No, 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 uh, no. The, the the story, Frank Herbert's story, is. Mm. Uh, a gem it's extremely extremely rich it's up there for me with mm. with actual scripture it's up there yeah. it, it, in a way the story of uh paul atreides is on a par as as a story with that of moses or jesus or muhammad it's that level it's that deep mm. it's that rich it really is well in fact it, it's bigger in a sense because more deep ends up spanning the universe <laughs> Um, so to reduce it to oh the goodies are white uh, the goodies are brown and the baddies are white mm. and therefore I don't like it. Mm, I well, just also, I, won't, I won't really have that I don't think. But it's also it's also wrong I guess on a technical perspective. It's almost um, it's a bit of a blinkered view of the story because technically, I mean, I mean he goes on to basically genocide and, and wage war across the. I mean. Most people don't consider that good, you know. So, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. on what perspective uh, is he good? I guess on that level, then. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to the the jihad, the uni the universe wide jihad say. in a bit. I but they didn't were, call they were, it that. They were, no, they didn't use the word jihad, did they? Mm. Uh, there's references. I did notice to, that. There are, there are. Uh, yeah, it does sort of hint at it, doesn't it? But in the novel, it's quite explicit a number of times. But I'll get to that in a bit later. So that's the main yeah, criticism yeah. I've seen. On online, which I didn't agree with. Now, my personal criticisms, I've only got a couple and they are nitpicky and they're probably very personal ones. Although I did so see well. Mark Commode agree with one of mine and I, and I, I despise Mark Commode. Uh, but he happened to have the same, the same take as me on one of them, which is Christopher Walken. Okay. Christopher what, okay. What, so yeah. I have an issue, sort of. Christopher but it'll Walken. it be interesting to hear what you think. Well, obviously, he's a, uh, a a superb actor, one of the greatest guys ever to do it. Mm. I'm not saying he's not, but he plays it pretty much as Christopher Walken. He has his voice. That's he has his thing. he has his hair. It's Christopher Walken, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the emperor, the emperor of the universe, Shadam the Fourth. He's Christopher Walken. It just it just jars a bit. Um, it would have been yeah. nice if they could have got a, a, an unknown actor. It might have been nice. Or someone that exudes sort of an imperial gravitas, right? Yeah. Uh, Crystal Walken, Nicholson. maybe, maybe. But even then, it would um, for me. It might have, I would have liked someone an unknown, really. Um, mm. But nonetheless, despite saying that, Christopher Walken, it doesn't ruin it. It's just, yeah. it's just. Oh, the Emperor's Walken. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other, the, the, the other main one, the other main criticism I had is about Cheney. Um, okay. in the book, she's not really annoying at all. She, she's mm. not really, uh, she doesn't really talk back to Paul much or, or create a problem around herself. She's there for him to serve him. She worships him as, 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 as Muldib, as, as the, as a Liban, Lisan al Gaib, as much as anybody else. Whereas in the movie, mm. they make her sort of. A, a bit an, an annoying to be quite honest and that uh, and yeah. she sort of she she's a bit of a hassle for him in some ways or or uh, uh, anyway so they did that for some reason um and and I, I think they're the only two the only two things i sort of could really point to and they're actually 
quite minor things, to be honest. Um, neither of them come anywhere close to ruining the film for me. What about do you? you think, then, well, so, I mean, I agree with the Christopher Walken aspect. I mean, it doesn't annoy me. I was, I will say this, I was really excited when he was announced. I was like, that's brilliant. That is inspired casting. Haven't seen him in anything for ages. He's such a great actor. That will be amazing. And yeah, I mean, he was literally just Christopher Walken. Um, right. I was expecting him to at least ham it up a little bit. You know, that would have been nice. Um, mm. And even the clothing was a bit, it was underwhelming for, you know, for the Emperor. But it, did, it didn't ruin it remotely. It was one of those things because, you know, although, was, although his presence is, is big and he's important, it's almost inconsequential to the overall movie. So, you know, he sort of mm. came and he went and mm. I was like, okay, fine. Like, sure. Mm. You know, it's a bit of a missed opportunity, but it didn't affect the quality of the film overall. Um, mm. And then, yeah, so with, with Cheney, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, yeah, you're right. Like, she she, she is essentially a, a very dutiful follower um, to Paul. And I do wonder what they're trying to set up with that, where they're trying to go with that. Mm. Because ultimately, the idea would be, I would imagine, and the very clear intent is, is to do uh, Dune Messiah. Mm-hmm. But she's gone off into the desert now, and she's gonna. Mm. I I don't. And and with a sort of bad attitude towards like, w- mm. what are they trying to set up? Yeah, you know. Yeah, she's got a bit of a bad attitude, which isn't in mm. the books. And one other thing I say, some one of the criticisms online on Twitter or whatever, is that she, the actress, isn't pretty enough. Um, now, I, I don't, I don't think that actress. She's actually much prettier in real life. They they made her look uglier for the film. But yeah, in the book, she's described as good looking, like a desert rose or something. But she's not described as sort of exquisitely beautiful. The Princess Irulan mm. is, is supposed to be sort of exquisitely beautiful. And uh, who played her? Is it Florence Pugh? So Florence that, was, Pugh, yeah. that was that was well cast because she is uh, she is drop dead gorgeous. Uh, but Cheney isn't supposed to be necessarily drop dead gorgeous. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, that's one little criticism. Oh, one other thing I've just remembered that is in the novels that isn't in the in in the film. Um, is that they have a kid. Uh, Paul and Chaney mm. have a child in the bit between where three years, they skip ahead three years. They've had a child, little Leto. Yeah. Um, and, they, and you never see him. There's no scene with him. He's mentioned a bunch of times. Then he dies. The Harkonnens kill him in a raid at some point. Um, mm. but again, off camera, off page. And so you never see him, but they did have a son. And they, they've obviously, where well, they've decided to make the whole time frame a lot shorter they just they just cut all of that out mm. um so yeah they're the sort of really that. my only criticisms i think yeah I, I don't think stuff like that it doesn't affect i mean it doesn't affect what the overall outcome of the movie was or sort of what they narrative wise what they where they were going with it I, I think that i think they i think that was absolutely fine really as changes to be honest hmm. um yeah, some of it's interesting. What did you think of um, what did you think of the the the, the sort of design choices uh, that they went with uh, for all of the characters? So, I mean, just the overall set designs and things oh, like that. Superb, absolutely superb. Because in mm. the novel, lots of things are described in a fair amount of detail, but lots of things aren't. Lots of things mm. aren't. Um, like, for example, um, where, where you see uh, Jessica. Uh, when she becomes um, uh, uh, one of the reverend mothers, how they transport someone on the back of a worm over long distances. Th- there's no description of that, but then, mm. that, but they do actually show you it in, and uh, you know, things like that were done very, very well. They never describe in any detail all the sort of face markings or sort of face tattoos Jessica gets. Uh, yeah. A lot of the clothing, the still suits are described in loads of detail in the book, but nearly everyone else's uh, uniforms and things aren't. I think it was done very, very good. You know, things like uh, the Thopters are great. Thopters are really great. Um, the big, like, spice, uh, the, the, the spice, the big spice machines, um, mm. they, they look, they all look great. Um, yeah, no, can't really fault anything on that side of stuff. Um, yeah. What about you? No, 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 I, I would agree. I genuinely, I didn't have any issue with 
sort of designs and I'm trying to pick your brain, I guess, to see if there's any anything else we um, got an issue with. But no, I mean, yeah, no, not really. Um, I enjoyed it all from from a, a design choice perspective. I think that they did really well. Going back to like Florence Pugh's character, for instance, I think they did a really good job with you know making her appear sort of royal. Oh, I, I get royal. I don't know. There, there was a there was a imperial, a deification imperial, sir, sort of, not merely you know, royal. Mm. But yeah, I, I great. I, I think they did such a good job. Um, and it, I looked at it. Well, it was Hans Zimmer uh, that okay. did the score, so I was you. Um, you were right. I was. I was wrong. One or two um, other things then to say. I think maybe about the casting. I thought it was very good because Paul is difficult to cast because he's supposed to be fifteen and a young fifteen, and then by the end he's supposed to be eighteen and a leader of men. Mm. So you've got to be both those things. That's really difficult. Um, I think they got it. I think they got it just about right with that Chamolet fella, um, Gurney think- Halleck. Um, um, who's who's the guy um, from the Brolin. Guinness? Josh Brolin. Um, that's very very good. I thought Big Dave Batista as the Bistro Band was brilliant. That was great. Uh, Austin Butler as the Nar Baron, brilliant. He's a great actor. Um, mm. I think he's probably got a great career ahead of him. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, the Lady Jessica is, is just about right. Even in June 1, um, Leto, the old, the, the Duke, the first, Leto the first, Paul's father, mm. that was, he was cast very well, I thought. What, what did you um, think of um, Javier Bardem? Oh, Stilgar. brilliant. Brilliant. A still guy. Yeah. No, that was, that yeah. was, that was, again, kind of perfect for me. Um, so maybe would it be all right if I could um, do a bit bit of a deviation? Of course, um, deviate. Talk, um, um, and as I threatened to talk a little bit about Lawrence of Arabia, yeah, no, and I'm, Seven I'm, Pillars I'm of Wisdom, in. because Frank Herbert's first novel came out in 1965, I believe it was. And the film Lawrence of Arabia came out in like 1962. And the book that the film Lawrence of Arabia is based on is T.E. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia is a real person from World War One, And his book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, came out between the wars. And for me, I've never seen Frank Herbert hardly ever. I've hardly seen any of him in interview. I really should look some up. But he will have read Seven Pillars of Wisdom because June, at least June 1 is... <laughs> a reworking of Lawrence of Arabia in all sorts of ways. I didn't read Seven Pillars of Wisdom until I was in my 30s. And when mm. I read it, I'm like, this is, this is, ju- Frank Herbert is, is plagiarizing bits here. This is, it, it, really, it's, it, it's, it's, it's as much as that, I would say, in places. So um, just a very super, super quick overview of what Lawrence, of a, what T.E. Lawrence did and what the book Seven Pillars of Wisdom is. Um, so it's World War One, the war in the East, the the, mm. the the war against the Ottoman Turk in World War One, and the the guerrilla war that the Arabs have against the Ottoman Turk and the sort of sort of secret special special services intelligence services help that that the Arabs get from the British against mm. the Ottomans, and it's so the Bedouin, the Arab Bedouin of World War One, are the Fremen. Mm. It, or rather put the Fremen are the, the Bedouin yeah, Arabs yeah. from World War I. Um, there's, there's a great tribal, a real, again, a real historical figure, an, unbelie- an unbelievable tribal tribal figure um, called Alda, Alda Abu Tayyi. That is Stilgar. <laughs> Stilgar is Alda in all sorts of ways. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia is Paul. <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia goes from being not a boy, but in a young man, a young, callow, inexperienced man to a warrior, to mm. a leader of men. That is what T. Lawrence does in two or three years. And it's Paul. <laughs> it, it is Paul. Um, and, and so and, and there's, there's so many more parallels. There's so many more parallels. The one that really sticks in my mind is when the Fremen attack Arakeen at the end, towards the end. And there's sort of a big worm charge, isn't mm. there? There's, they charge worms um, at, at, at Arakeen. There's so many parallels there with a with 
among the most important battles, quote unquote battles, that Lawrence of Arabia and Abu al Tayy had against the Ottomans, um, one at Aqaba. There's a big camel charge against the Ottoman positions at Aqaba. Oh, and wow. when I saw the, 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 the worms charging, uh, uh, Iraqi in June 2, it, I immediately thought of, of Lawrence at Aqaba. So, um, so almost direct parallel then. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And Paul, I mean, Lawrence, of Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, was not the leader. He was sort of a British intelligence services person, something between mm. a military officer and a spy. It's not really clear. Uh, it was never really clear in Lawrence's own mind, but that's what he was. Whereas the leader of the Arabs uh, was Faisal, Prince Faisal. And and so Paul Atreides is sort of both Prince Faisal and and mm. T. E. Lawrence. Anyone that's completely familiar with either Seven Pillars of Wisdom or the film Lawrence of Arabia, hopefully will completely agree with me on that. Uh, but again, the the that there's there's so many parallels. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop there because I could go on and on and on about them, even sort of individual words. And 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 so to build on that. Um, in the both the novel and, of course, the films and the 1984 version, um, the Fremen are uh, they're, they're, they're Arabs, they're, they're Muslim, right? Yeah. Their, their big war is called a jihad. Um, there's a few times uh, Paul is described, along with being called the Lizan al Gaib, he's called the Mahdi. Mm. They call him the Mahdi. That's Islam, simple as that. And there's loads of other words. There's loads and loads of other words. In fact, there's one point in the novel where they mention, the Fremen mention their ancestors, and he calls them their Sunni ancestors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah, that's... And, and there's more... In fact, there's lots and lots of really subtle things. If you weren't kind of familiar with, um, with Islamic history, would, would go mm. over your head. There's lots of them. Um, there really, they're really are lots of them. Now, again, one thing to say is that Frank Herbert was born in like 1920. Mm. So it was like in his mid 40s when this came out. I, I would bet absolutely everything I own, he'd read Seven Pillars of Wisdom probably more than once. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and, his exposure uh, to sort of Islam would be so, it would be minor uh, given that sort of time period otherwise. So if he hadn't, it, where, where else would the sort of inspiration come from otherwise? Right, yeah, we we it's easy to forget the world pre nine eleven for us in the twenty twenties. Mm. Um, Islam played a much smaller role in the consciousness of the West in yeah. the twentieth century, much much smaller. And it was it was also a lot more. I think, I think it's fair to say this. Um, it was a lot more. It's a lot more sort of mysterious and romantic, even. Um, it's oh, not, it, it, right, there was um, it, it. It just wasn't in people's consciousness. It just wasn't like it. It, it wasn't politicized as much, you know. Again, pre, uh, as as you say, that's probably a good reference point. Pre nine eleven, hmm. the gen hmm. gen gen pop general person on the street, you, hmm. they wouldn't have much of a knowledge of it all. It hmm. wasn't really around that much, it, it, you know. And just, um, and one of the things in Islam is that there is there is one God. There is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, now, a lot of that is mirrored in Maldib, that there mm. is there is one yeah. Mahdi, uh, there, there is there is one way, um, and that we are all one. There's there's one religion. There's one. There will be one jihad, one wild fanatical jihad, which will spread like wildfire across the whole universe. I mean, it's it's sort of it's sort of all there. Um, mm. And so, you know, Frank Herbert is um, what you would call like a, a, a 20th century sort of Islamophile. He's obviously deeply had a deep impression, just like T. Lawrence. On some mm. level, T. Lawrence was a Christian and never stopped being a Christian and never really dreamt of converting to Islam, even though they asked him very, very politely many, many, many times. He didn't. But he was obviously on, on some other level, loved Islam. Mm. Um, um, yeah. So yeah, so th there's there's that there's that thing to it. It's uh, well, I guess it is that romantic romanticization uh, of, of it all. I guess that from from that sort of level. Um, mm. But it is interesting, isn't it? How they the choice of words, mm. you know. So, but that that perfectly encapsulates it, right? So, 1984 version, they use the word jihad. It's fine, whatever jihad. They're like, yeah, the jihad. 
books jihad modern day can't use that word mm. because it's in public consciousness of actually what it is <laughs> so it's interesting yeah. isn't yeah. it a, a, a religious know. war yeah um yeah so uh, maybe maybe you should touch on that then because in the second film certainly you see some of paul's sort of waking dreams or some of his dreams um and it's uh sort of this hellscape of 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 uh, of somebody or people sort of dying or writhing in terrible pain and uh, things like that and uh you see it two or three times in the film bodies piling um, high yeah yeah Billions. and they don't and they don't explain it in the film it's sort of left unexplained in the book um it it cuts back to that a number of times half a dozen times maybe more and it's completely explicit it's just it just says it flat out um that Paul fears that what he's doing will one day lead to, or maybe um, there's no way to avoid it leading to, yeah, a, a universe wide, not a galactic wide, a universe wide jihad. And that he, he will have legions of fanatical warriors, the Fremen, um, sort of endless legions of them um, storming across the universe and under, under the green and black banner of the Atreides, and that his banner will become a, a thing of horror and terror. Um, and, um, and Paul's haunted by that. Paul doesn't want that to happen. He's terrified by that. Uh, in fact, it goes on and on and on about Paul is, is uh, haunted by his, a sense of his own terrible purpose. And he mm. tries endlessly to try and avoid it. Um, um, and then, well, maybe in a bit, we can talk about his, the, the, con the idea, the concept of him being able to see into the future and the Kwisak Haderach and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I don't know if you want to go there yet. Um, but yeah, I, well, I suppose I, I don't want to belabor the point, but there is there are all these parallels with uh, with, with Islam. Um, well, no, I mean, I think it's important. I, I think I think it's interesting to draw the, 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 the sort of parallels out uh, and, and discuss them because it's very clearly the inspiration behind the whole book in general anyway. Um, so, because yeah, you, I mean... Sorry, because when you look at Stilgar, for example, um, again, brilliantly acted, I thought, mm. um, Stilgar is um, a a religious warrior. <laughs> Paul is a, a, a figure of religious veneration for them. Uh, There's a deity almost yeah, at that the, point. Yeah, the, the Lissam al-Gaib is supposed to be, you know, the, the voice from, from the outer world. He's the Mahdi. There's no, there's no other better way of putting it. He's, he's the Mahdi. He's a, a messiah. In fact, the second yeah. book is called June Messiah, isn't it? Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and and there's this 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 idea that what you do, if you're a messiah-type figure or a prophet or a, 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 a historical real human being, but one that ends up being venerated you know, on a spiritual mm. or religious level, that the real reality of you and your life and what you said and did will absolutely inevitably get morphed and changed and exaggerated uh, and, and all those sorts of things um, sort of out of all mm. proportion. There's, there's one great bit in the book where he says when he's going to ride the worm for the first time, when he's going to tame Shai Hulud for the first time, he says, you know, if I die here today, um, the train of events is already set in motion that there will still be uh, a, a jihad in my name. And, and if I live, um, it'll be, it'll be a slightly different one but there'll still be one. Um, there's one great bit when he first sort of realizes what's happening, um, that he says, that he, he realizes that the only way he could stop um, this jihad mm. is if um, everyone around, if he kills every single person around him and his own mother and his unborn sister and himself. That's the only way to stop it because it it's already got its, uh, its own momentum. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they, they really, I mean, they really shied away from that um, mm -hmm. that sort of aspect in, in in part two. But they they showed the the sort of consequences of vener veneration and, and deification in a different fashion, didn't they? Because they they showed it from the perspective of him being an, a, a sort of unwitting vehicle for deification. So he'd be like, no, 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 and they'd be like, oh, so humble. He's definitely the, <laughs> you know. So they showed it from a different fashion, but. It's just an interesting choice. I wonder why they chose to to sort of steer clear 
you know, from from the the you know the the, the sort of warning, uh, you know, of, of sort of deification in that way, so explicitly, uh, like they did it in the book. Or it wasn't really a warning, was it, in the book? But the the sort of more obvious nature of it. Mm. I think maybe because it's just sort of in bad taste these days. Mm. A bit, it would be bordering yeah. on blasphemous or something, and people <laughs> seem to be worried or scared about that for some reason, even though it's yeah, not that's century. Um, yeah, um, so there's so well, we we'll have to mention a little bit about um, the Bene Gesserit, right? Mm. Uh, and and, and um, the the, the mission art uh, uh, protectiva that the Bene Gesserit for ninety generations have been manipulating and fiddling around with the bloodlines of the great houses um uh, the great, fascinating the, the great fascinating the great houses of the Lazarus. this story it honestly is as deep and as rich as actual scripture yeah. um, well, well they are going to be doing um, um a bene gesserit uh hbo max series are they? so oh, that well. yeah 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 so that'll be interesting that'll be really yeah, interesting be. to see what what sort of avenue they take and which I don't know. I can't remember if it was a prequel or a sequel, um, or where it sits in the timeline. But it is something that they're doing, and so that'll be fascinating. Because I would imagine, not to get too off topic, because obviously you know we we'll talk about that in the film aspect. But I do wonder if they will take the Bene Gesserit and almost, um, you know, tell their story from, I, I guess, like a political scheming angle. You know, so they sort of move move between the houses and then meet up. What are they doing? Well, we're doing this. Oh, okay. Well, we need to move back and and then sort of see the mach the machinations of their sort of um, plans sort of cut. You know, come to fruition here and there, and then they meet up again. And then I wonder if they'll go that avenue with it, um, mm -hmm. just to sort of see. I don't. I just it's fascinating. It, it's such a such an interesting thing to have mm -hmm. the sort of sisterhood mm -hmm. of beings that are. Uh, trying to culminate in the 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 sort of ultimate well yeah the, the ultimate being it's it's mind-blowing really oh yeah yeah it's so deep and rich the story mm. the backstory the universe of june it's unbelievable so just to let people know super quick who may not have, may not know um there's this one particular sect i suppose you could call it a religious sect in the empire called the bene Gesserit, and they're all female they're often uh disparaged as the bene Gesserit witches and they've got a few powers mm. like they can sort of command with their voice if they say something and you're weak-minded it's like a jedi mind trick you just sort of find yourself doing what they just commanded they've got powers like that not real not full-blown superhumans but they've got some powers okay and their whole raison d'etre the whole point of them is that for generation after generation they manipulate bloodlines among the the, the great and lesser houses of the lands red in order that hopefully they will produce again a, like a messiah figure that the the quasar cataract right and so these Bene Gesserit, um, they also have some prescience. They're able to sort of see back through time. They're sort of able to pass along the collected memories of their ancestors to each other. And um, but no man can do it apart from. Oh, oh, and their collected memories are only through other Bene Gesserit witches. So all, all female, it's all completely female through the female line. Uh, but if, if there is ever, ever a male that would be able to do it, he would be the one, the chosen one, the Quasak Hadarach. And men, apparently men have tried before and it kills you if you try. Um, and so, again, there's like, it's again, this this idea of the one, the chosen one, a Mahdi, a Messiah, uh, a semi-divine being of some type. Mm. Well, it ends up being Paul. Um, so he's both he's both sort of the, the Mahdi on Arrakis on June, desert planet, um, and also becomes the uh, the it, ultimate. Realise he becomes the universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, no. Sorry, um, he doesn't. It's not. It's not him in the end. You think it is him for a long time, but it's actually ultimately. You know, I don't want to ruin things for people, but it's. I think it's his grandson in the end, isn't it? It's the actual the Kazakh Kalarach. But it, yeah, it, it, anyway, that's grandson, for uh, much much later. Man. It's Honestly. his grandson that turns into half human, half worm thing. That's way down the line. Yeah. That's books, yeah, books ahead. Yeah. We won't, well, won't complicate things with that. Um, but what Paul can do is he, ha he, he Jessica teaches him the voice, you know, that, mm. that ability to sort of um, manipulate and certainly at least weak minded people just by commanding them with such authority that they just do as they're told sort of thing. It's sort of a almost se semi magical thing. Uh, mm. But also being able to see back 
through time and Paul sort of seems to have a natural ability. If you imbibe the spice, which you do on Arrakis just by breathing and it's in all the food, that enhances it as well. Although ultimately you get sort of, you build up a resistance to it. But Paul has sort of a natural ability, plus the teachings of his mother, plus the spice, plus he takes the waters of life at one point, which blows it all through the roof. Anyway, Paul, and it's really important to know that Paul, by about halfway through the, or two thirds of the way through the first novel, um, is able to see back in time and forward in time, which no one's mm. able to do. That really does make him special. So Frank Herbert says something like that he's he finds that he has sort of th three eyes. He's got an, an inner eye, a third inner eye, and he's able to have one eye on the past, one eye on the present, and one sort of imperfect eye on the future. That's going to all that sort of thing's very difficult to do in a film. Um, mm. well, yeah, how, uh, how would you? Frank Herbert describes it as. Uh, and Paul sort of learns how to see into the future. And that, um, mm. he describes it like like you're on the surface of an ocean, a choppy, wavy ocean. And sometimes you're in the trough of the waves and you can't really see much ahead at all. And other times you're on the crest of a wave and you can see really far. But mm. always, but always there's like a shore, a promenade, a promenade on the shoreline, which is this universe wide jihad that's always there. No matter where you are, that's always sort of looming over him, and that's always visible, mm. sort of uh, shining out of the to. future at him. Yeah, um, I, I don't think you would have been able to, have, mm. creatively speaking, get that to work mm. tonally. Very difficult with what they were presenting. I think the, yeah, I, I think the sort of brief uh, flashes of. Uh, you know, of, of the sort of bodies piling high and things like that, that they showed. Hmm. I think that worked quite well. I think, hmm. yeah, I, I can't think of another way where it would have worked, which would have fit the tone of the movie. I don't think it would have worked in any other way. Well, it's difficult to do in prose. Like I say, I first read it when I was 16 or 17. I didn't really get it. There's like whole, whole paragraphs. So I'm like, what is being said there? I don't really understand. <laughs> And it took till I was a bit older to sort of, you know, re truly really grasp what everything that's mm. being said and stuff. Um, you know, he talks about um, a, a time, it gets a bit metaphysical almost in places in the novel. He talks about sort of a time nexus and that the, and that there's a, a, a boiling of possibilities and Paul can see out mm. there's all different lines, all different avenues of possible futures. And what is the present anyway? What does that mean? You know, it's all a bit 1960s, hippy dippy, metaphysical you know, bordering on nonsense a little bit, very close. But but no, that's not fair. It's not. It's great. It's brilliantly written. It's br brilliantly written. But it's going to be impossible to put into film. Mm. Well, I think I think that's uh, I, I think that's interesting. That, that yeah, I, I think yeah, you you wouldn't you simply wouldn't be able to sh put that on film anyway. Um, mm. But also, I don't think it would have served the purpose of how they were presenting it in terms of Paul's sort of motivation in the film, because he, again, he was sort of, the sense I got <clears throat> in terms of how they were portraying it was he he, he sort of suspected that the, the, the war was coming, didn't know why. And I think there was, at one point, it almost seemed like he was like, oh, it's, it, my mum's going to cause the war, you know. Mm. Um, <laughs> she, she's, she's the one sort of spurring it on. Mm. And then... And then he sort of embraced it like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to have to do it. You know, I'm going to have to become this this sort of figurehead uh, and, mm -hmm. and move forward with the war myself. But it wasn't it wasn't as if he was... The way they presented it was was more like a reluctancy to it all. It wasn't like a, you know, he wasn't sort of racing towards it in that fashion. Uh, he didn't... And he wasn't trying to embrace that the sort of deification either. It was almost like he, he sort of carried that moniker as and when it's suited to serve the purpose moving forwards until he then drank the waters of life. And he was like, Oh no, actually shit. You know, this is, I'm yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm good now. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> go, go full steam ahead with the jihad, I guess. Well, no, that's good. Again, that is, that is all in the novel. So when he sort of first mm. sort of becomes aware of this, he's sort of terrified by this possible future that he's, it's, it seems that he's unable to avoid. There's a few bits in the caves where he, he realizes that, every sort of blink of an eye, every sort of movement of a grain of sand makes whole levers across the possible future universe change. And that even doing nothing is a type of action in and of itself. 
um, and, and all that sort of thing. And yeah, and he realizes that Jessica, sort of un, unbeknownst to herself, mm. will egg it all on or has already egged it all on, is in largely in all sorts of ways responsible for it in the first place. Well, she by, was very by, scheming. By birthing him. The, yeah. And by making the sure they don't die and all, all that sort of thing. She's responsible for it too. And he mm. resents her for it, again, at least at first. Absolutely resents her for it, blames her for mm. it. And he's terrified by this terrible purpose, this, this possible future that seems increasingly unavoidable. Um, so, yeah, it's right that he's reluctant, absolutely reluctant, and even a bit pissed off at Jessica. Yeah. Well, yeah, what he, yeah, he, he um, yeah, the, the, the sort of Jessica, I, I think the character is quite an interesting one, Jessica, because she's yeah. shown quite well in the movie to be communicating a lot um, with the, I can't remember the name, the child, the baby, um, to scheme, to push things forward. And it's almost, you know, to, to well, you know, we, we can, we, we've got to move to the, to the South because there's lots of fundamentalists there. We need to, you know, sort of strengthen our position here uh, and move, move things forward. So she's really egging it on uh, in a conscious way alongside uh, the unborn, because obviously it wasn't born. Uh, the unborn sister, uh, mm. her daughter. Alia. So, yeah, mm. Saint Alia. Yeah, in the novel, Jessica, I would say, is easily the second most important character, and mm. arguably, arguably, she's more important or has more page time, if you like. Well, she than always Paul. comes across evil in the movie, in in mm. kind of what she's doing with the scheming. Did you get that impression or not? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, because I'm so familiar with 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 the book, um, mm. not so much because I, you, in the book they get Frank Herbert gives you people's inner monologue all the yeah. time, so you sort of know that she's she's um, cynical and just doing what she needs to do to survive and keep Paul alive. Mm. But yeah, in the in the film, especially June two, if you came to it cold and you hadn't read the book, she would probably come across as just sort of yeah, some something bordering on. Uh, evil, yeah, or so cynical that it's evil in some way. Mm. Um, which really, or I think what Frank Herbert had in mind was that she's just trying to keep them alive. Well, I guess uh, it's out of necessity, isn't it? It's action out mm. of necessity. So mm. we plus, must embrace this. Plus she's been a Jesuit. It's her whole point is to serve. Her whole point in life is to uh, forward the Bene Gesserit calls. Um mm. So again, that's sort of yeah, that's what she's there for. So, sorry, yeah, I think I spoke, spoke over you there. Apologies. No, well, I I, I want to go back to um, Kynes and and Cheney because they completely rejected all of the sort of connection there, didn't they? Didn't go anywhere. Well, Leah Kynes, the planetologist, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so in the novel, there's a massive character, Leah Kynes, the planetologist, who's supposed to be Cheney's father, and in the yeah. novel, in the first half, first third of it, he's a massive character. Massive, massive mm. character. There's, um, yeah, and what he does and says is really, really important. He he makes he turns the Fremen from being a, a fairly sort of what you might say a, a hopeless desert people into into uh, a, a, a great people that end up sort of conquering the universe. Uh, all that you can put at the feet of Liat Kyans in the first place, um, and yeah, and the films do skate over that heavily, to put it mildly. Yeah. yeah. And also, it's a woman, so not a bloke. <laughs> yeah, do you, who who is it in the first? Who who plays? It's just the. the I don't know the actress. It's a it's a black woman that they had. Is it's that so, it's so such Leah an Kynes? inconsequential part. They don't really do anything with it. To is be that fair. supposed to be Leah Kynes, that black woman? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it? <laughs> yeah. That uh, that. Oh. I went way over your head then. <laughs> yeah, way over my head. Way over my head. Yeah, but I thought I mean. that... it, they didn't go anywhere with it. It's such a bizarre way to do it. Well, so just to say then, in the novels, Leah Kynes is supposed to be um, the judge of change. Well, where the, the, the House Harkonnen controlled Arrakis, and the mm. Emperor ordered that they've got to get out and leave the the, the fief of Arrakis, and the House of Trades will take over. And there's a sort of a, supposed to be a judge of the change or a lord of uh, to sort of oversee that everything's done fairly. And it's this guy called Leah Kynes, who's like an ecologist or a planetologist who's supposed to know mm. everything about ecology and planetology and, and some sort of ultimate imperial arbiter. And he's really, really important. And he, he's, a, he's, he, he, he's gone native 
He's gone Fremen. His eyes from so in, 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 from eating so much spice, his eyes have gone. The whites of his eyes have gone blue, blue within blue. blue, within blue. And 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 the Fremen absolutely absolutely trust him or look up to him as um, uh, some sort of not quite saviour, not quite messiah, but mm. absolutely comes because he's told them what they need to do in order to basically terraform Arrakis into a, a, a planet of plenty. Um, mm. So, so again, at least in the first half of the novel, it's a massive character. And when he dies, the Harkonnen, when the Harkonnen re-attack the the uh, the Atreides, um, he's taken out into the, into the desert and left there to die, which he does. And there's a very long scene in the novel of his very long, poignant scene of his death in the novel, where he hallucinates about his father and all sorts of things. Um, so to change that to that. That black woman character that that drowns a, a, a baby maker to get the waters of life that passed me by that that's supposed to be Leah Leah Kynes uh, just uh, yeah mm. that's in fact that has now taken the top spot in my criticisms <laughs> of it. Um, I thought uh, she was just supposed yeah. to be a Fremen. I thought she was just supposed to be like a, uh, a oh, Reverend Mother Helper. About... That black no, woman, I don't know if we're talking about the same person. So the okay. it, it's the the the. Again, it's such an inconsequential character, so I, I, I don't think you... I think you're referencing a different person there. Oh, okay. So in All the right. first one, yeah. there was a, a black lady with dreadlocks. It's her. Uh, Do you remember yeah. her? Yes, yes. Okay, so they've just completely sex and race swapped that. Yeah. For some, re for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Just very, very bizarre thing. And then doesn't really go anywhere with the character, to be mm. honest. But then they didn't. In the '84 version, uh, when right. they had the uh, great Max von Sydow, Sydow mm. um, in great the role, actor. they didn't really do a lot. They did a, they did a fair amount, but not a lot. Certainly nowhere uh, sort of novel origins anywhere. That's for sure. Um, I do think that there's some stuff Denis, I, I guess, used as inspiration from the 84 version i think that's the sort of role of um kinds is one of them because it's, it's an odd choice to do isn't it to to sort of minimize the role as as much as mm. both mm. versions have done mm. yeah i suppose maybe just because from a narrative point of view it's it's a dead end he mm. he, he just dies the harkers just sort of murder him uh but it, in the novel anyway it's a, it's a really important one. there's appendices in the novel mm. that's a, uh, and they're, they're all by Leah Kynes and um and um talking about the nature of Arrakis and 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 what the deep future will hold for the terraforming of Arrakis and things and there's even a story about Leah Kynes his father the sort of the first planetologist that was sent there by the Imperium and and his unfortunate death in a cave-in and it's quite it's quite deep I mean the first June novel is quite thick it's quite a thick book mm. um and 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 the way the Fremen look up to him, he's sort of an actual tribal leader in some way. And he absolutely saves Jessica and Paul's life in the first instance mm -hmm. when they have to flee into the desert. Um, it's that kind that is responsible for keeping them alive. Um, so, yeah, yeah uh, um, I suppose if you had to cut a, one very, very big character, Maybe it, it it would be him, or you know, it's like missing out Doctor Yui or something. You, you, I feel like you sort of can't. He yeah. has to be in there somewhere. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's sort of yeah, no, true. Well, it's, it's plot elements, isn't it? So yeah, interesting. Yeah. What what did you think of? Um, so to go to the sort of changes from the novel to the movie, it's obviously time jump in the novel movie none. Um, I think they did a good job of displaying a sort of a, a figurative m sort of maturation of uh, Paul with sort of how, how stern he became. And, I, you know, sort of commanding, sort of became more of a presence on screen. Because mm. if you mm. go back mm. and watch the first one in conjunction with the second, he has mm. significant more presence as he you know, sort of embraces the role a little bit more. And I guess mm. that would, if you're, if you're sort of, you know, marrying it up to the novel per se, it would, it would sort of go in conjunction with that. And I think they did a really good job of his screen presence and his sort of 
sort of like a charisma, I don't know, commanding voice, whatever it was. I think they did a good job of that there. I don't know what you thought about that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Like I say, in the 84 version with McCrumlin, mm. they could completely fail. They completely fail to, to do that. Really. 30 um, from the off. Yeah, right. So I think they do it really, really well. And it's done really well in the novel. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that, so one of the things I would say about the first June book is that it's a coming of age story. Um, Paul starts as a, a boy. And by the end, he, well, by the end, he's the emperor. <laughs> Mm. Um, and 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 truly commands authority as an as a, like an eighteen year old. That's a diff, difficult arc to make realistic in any way. <laughs> yeah. And and the novel does it, but that's because Frank Herbert is a master, in my opinion, of storytelling. But to pull that off with a screenplay and to depict it on screen, even harder, perhaps. And I think mm. they did a bloody good job of it. I, yeah. I do think that I do think that that Timothy Chalamet could maybe have bulked on a, a bit more upper body, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> but, no, um, very true. Um, very true. But, a um, slight frame. But then he's supposed to be, you know, at the bit not only only a few months are supposed to have passed. So how yeah. can you go from a, a believable fifteen-year-old to a believable uh, eighteen-year-old leader um, in months physically? That's that's very difficult. Mm. So. There are a few bits, but the story is a sort of a coming of age story in a way. Um, that that transformation from from childhood to manhood, um, and that you that at some point, and we, we all go through it, don't we? If you survive to adulthood, <laughs> that at some point you have to put away childish things. You've got mm. to come to terms with the fact that the world is pretty brutal, or can be, um, and and that's reality. You've got to yeah. deal with that. You've got you've got to deal with it. Uh, you can't run away from it. It's coming for you. But it's also okay, the um, the, the ability to embrace responsibility, which mm -hmm. I guess is perfectly encapsulated with Paul's uh, sort of sense of what he has to do and what he has to become. It is that sense of uh, duty and responsibility, which is again, mm -hmm. you know, what you do as a as a as a person, as a man, uh, mm -hmm. as, as we all do. It's Full maturation as an individual is mm -hmm. understanding your roles, responsibilities and duties within your surroundings and mm -hmm. accepting that, you know, the rejection of that, I think, is philosophically speaking, is that sort of immaturity that people carry uh, moving forwards. They fail to mature. Mm -hmm. and, and as a child, you're sort of, or hopefully anyway, as a child, you're sort of fairly closeted uh, sort of fairly um uh, hopefully your parents for a, a while at least will sort of wrap you up in cotton wool and protect you from sort of the never-ending barrage of uh nastiness <laughs> that is the real world um uh, at, at some so. point not so much these days but you know <laughs> so, um, <like> so. <laughs> but at some point it says when paul first leaves caladan for arrakis right at the beginning he says he saw because that's a massive change, isn't it? When you have to mm. move or anything like that, uh, sort of a life-changing, profound, never to go back level change, and that's what adulthood, or at least going into adulthood, is all about. And that it's not going to stop. You're mm. going to have to come to terms with the fact that you will be bombarded by change and quite often unwelcome change and things. The death of your father, mm. the death of your father. Um, or the death of any parent, or the death of anyone extremely close to you that you that you love and cannot be replaced. Things as serious and as brutal as that, um, mm. you know. So uh, all those all those all those themes uh, come up in 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 June. I mean, he loses his father, doesn't he? His father is assassinated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how to come to terms with that? Not only uh, is your dad died or been killed or been murdered, but um, but you are now the head of the household. He is mm. now the Duke. Uh, all the responsibility is now yours. Uh, are you going to be crushed by that, or are you going to are you going to man up? Actually, have you got a chest or not? Are you going to wear mm. the trousers? All those. <laughs> it's a you know a coming of age story, not just from a little boy to a teenager coming of age story, but from a teenager to a full grown man with actual responsibility that you stare in the eye. That sort of coming of age thing. Now. Um, 
I say there's parallels there with Tiggy Lawrence as well. Goes from um, sort of quite quite a quite a, a, a naive, almost callow young man to uh, to a hard bitten a hard bitten man. Uh, uh, so um, there was a few bits. There were a few bits in in June two, which almost took my breath away. Uh, I actually got sort of tingles down the spine. Um, <laughs> Like the, the, the hairs on my forearm stood on end almost. One of the bits was when he rides the worm for the first time. Mm. Uh, because in the book, um, he's fully accepted as one of the Fremen. And they're pretty sure he's the Lisan al Um He's the Mahdi. Um, but until you've, until you've captured and ridden a worm for the first time, you can't be counted among one of the actual guerrilla warriors um whilst you're whilst you have to lean on another man to capture a worm for you um you 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 will remain a boy on some level um so that's part of the fremen sort of a, 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 almost a coming of age ritual or something is that you catch and ride a worm for yourself and you become a worm rider um um and well you, you become a man and so it's a really important thing in in the book and it's a, a metaphor for for growing up in all sorts of ways or becoming a man or something mm -hmm. something along those lines i think they I think they displayed that really well in the in the movie overall they did a mm -hmm. very very good job the sort mm -hmm. of intricacies in showing it all at one how it how how they do it was mm -hmm. very 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 interesting um mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. way to to sort of visualize it all um mm -hmm. Mm. And the response from the Fremen as well, that were, it, mm. it was a very interesting response, sort of seeing it instantaneously. And then the sort of evening of, I guess it was, it was yeah, the evening of, because it was a slight time jump, wasn't it? The sort of in, in the tents. Mm. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it is the sort of coming of age in conjunction with the sort of acceptance more so uh, into the Fremen all, all in one go as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's another quick thing to mention, the difference between the novel and, and the films, is that his naming as Muldib, or he picks his own name, Muldib, and um, that's his sort of private name, and, and his warrior name, Usul, um, mm. uh, and uh, a couple of other bits and bobs are sort of out of sequence and a bit different. The the the, the fight and the killing of Jameis is different in the novel. Um, it doesn't take place right away. It's back at their HQ or CH um so that's a bit different and a couple of little things are sort of moved around a bit it must just be for timing and pacing uh it doesn't ru it doesn't really ruin anything or make any real difference um i think they the probably did um sorry to i think they probably did the fight uh, uh janus to get something in part one right yeah like, it was the only that, real that, violent that action wasn't it in of. the first one yeah sorry go on. yeah well aside from the sort of siege but well, yes. With, yeah. with, yeah, that's. <laughs> I think. I think that was it. I think it was to get some more in sort of part one. I think. I think that's why. Mm. From that's all I can think of. I don't. I wouldn't. Otherwise, I don't see what purpose it would have served. I, I think it's yeah. just that. I mean, in 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 the book, the Fremen pick them up in the desert, and there's some sort of altercation between Jessica and Stilgar, but it's not. Too, mm. oh, and Paul disarms Jamis. And it's not yeah, till yeah. they get back to, as I say, the HQ a few scenes later or a few dozen pages later that Jameis then calls him out, then call, calls, calls Paul out, and then they fight to the death. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a bit different. Yeah, and um, and the naming conventions are um, done, staggered a bit differently in the book. But anyway, but well, the, the, the bit when he rides the worm for the first time, um, yeah, I did get a bit of a tingle because uh, there's a bit when... Um, when you first, he, he's got his hooks in um, and he's crouching down but then when he first stands when he first sort of gets off his knees and stands um yeah that's that sort of a, a moment because it proves to the fremen or well, and to himself but it proves to the fremen that he is the listen al gaib um that he almost certainly anyway is the mahdi and mm. For me, it's also he's he, he's not just the boy, not just the prince Paul. He's 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 the rightful Duke of Triades, son mm. of Leto, the son of Paulus Atreides, the old Duke. He is he is the one. 
the chosen yeah. one. And uh, well, I almost, I almost had to stop myself from standing up in the cinema and calling out Maldive, Maldive. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like doing that. I honestly felt like doing that. It got it got me there a little bit. Yeah. Um, there's another couple of. That's why I thought this film was very very good, especially uh, if you've read the novel and love the novel. There's a, a few other bits in it. Um, there's a bit when he meets up with Gurney Halleck. Mm. Um, in the novel. Gurney Halleck is Paul's favourite one of his father's uh, 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 men. Um, he's the only one out of, you know, uh, what, like um, uh, Duncan Idaho and um, Dr. Yui and there's Halleck and what's his mentor? Um, um, oh, God, I can't remember his name. Um, um, it's, an, it's an intricate name as well. Thulthia uh, Hawat, his father's original mentor who in the book mm. goes over and works for the Barrow and then commits suicide right at the end. All that seems to, anyway, anyway, Gurney, Gurney Halleck, the, uh, uh, the warrior bard, um, is Paul's favorite. And Gurney obviously loves, absolutely loves Paul as well. Um, and when they meet up, it's both powerful in the book, but in the film, again, it sort of, it sort of plucked at my heartstrings where Josh Brolin sort of, great acting sort of can't believe his eyes because he assumes Paul's dead. Um, yeah. and, and he finds him and they, they embrace and, uh, Paul just calls him gurney man. Um, and, uh, and he loves the, uh, and they had, as you see Josh Brolin playing the, uh, playing the Balaset. Um, he's mm. supposed to be like, a, both a warrior and, and, uh, a, a, a musician on some level. Um, and they sort of get that in there, or at least a reference to it here or there. Um, that that really got me. Um, there's what there's a couple other real quick, if I mention them real quick bits. Um, when Paul drinks the water of life, that's actually quite different in the novel. Um, it, it all happens off screen or off page, so to speak. And uh, we just find out that Paul's in some sort of coma and has been in some sort of coma for like two weeks, and he appears dead, but. But Jessica knows that he's actually not dead. He's just in some sort of deep, deep poisonous type coma and no one knows why. They, he didn't tell anyone he was going to sample the waters of life. And anyway, anyway, just to cut that short. When he first comes round from it, that means that, that the fact that he didn't die mm. means that he is either the Quasac Hadarach or is potentially still, is still a possibility that he is. It means that he's something more than a man. Mm. Less less than a god, but more than a man. It means that the Fremen were were right to to think of him as some sort of semi messiah, some sort of prophet, some sort of spiritual. Um, yeah, yeah, something more than a man. Put it that way. And so, in the film, when Paul's eyes flick open, and it's clear it's not dead, once or twice it, it sort of flicks to Jessica's face. And it flicks to Gurney's face. And um, again, they don't say anything in the film. So you wouldn't pro probably wouldn't pick up on it if you hadn't read the novel. But the acting is done perfectly. It's done very, very light touch. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is, is a, a superb bit of directing for me there because he could have mm. hit you over the head with, with that. Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah. He just leaves it to some very delicate, very quick shots of mm. Jessica, sort of the surprise and the wonder uh, the amazement on Jessica and Gurney's face that, oh, Paul is semi-divine or something. Um, well, so you say that, you, you could definitely see that from Gurney as well. So as from from meeting up, from the initial meet-up and the embrace, every single time Gurney watched Paul, you could see the respect grow. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and then it sort of culminated in, you know, sort of realizing that he is much more, but you could see it. And actually, if you, you know, again, if you watch it from, from that point onwards, or if you didn't pick up on it or whatever, it, it's, it's really well acted. It, it's, it's sort mm. of a nice, steady, slow respect build. And it's very nuanced in the sort of uh, emoting uh, of uh, Josh Brolin. Great actor, actually. Mm. Doesn't get mm. nearly enough mm. credit, to be fair. Yeah, no, I think he's a great actor. Um, one other point just to build on, the theme we were talking about of this this transition from a from um a, a boy a sort of a small 15 year old to uh a legit 
leader of men with authority and gravitas that's off the scale and he could be a believable emperor at 18 that arc um in um in uh the the book it it's done very well but in the film i thought they managed it very very well when paul the scene where paul sort of proclaims himself to the fremen um that he is he, he he you know he takes on board he is the lizan al gaib uh, there's which, a scene which, which we talk about we talk about yeah. when they're sort of under i think they were underground at the yeah, time that one. Are we talking about that one we sort of burst in yeah yeah and jessica's like no no you know go easy go easy yeah. but he's just yeah. going for it so a couple of things to say about that in the in the novel which they couldn't really do in the film is that paul isn't sure he's in a trough of being able to see the future. He's not sure at all if he's going to come out of this alive. So he's playing a real, uh, you know, he's playing a real game of chance here. Um, mm. He's throwing the dice higher politically and seeing where the chips fall. Um, he's got, he's, he's got to risk everything because again, we, they do it in the film, but it, there's more of it in the novel where he's not allowed. He's technically not allowed to speak in that arena, in that uh, mm. gathering only leaders of tribes are allowed to speak. Now, Paul's tribe is is led by Stilgar. And he's supposed to challenge Stilgar in single combat, defeat him, kill him, legitimately, legally, if you like, take the leadership of that tribe. And only then does that even entitle him to speak, let alone proclaim him all of their leader. Mm. So, so he foregoes all of that. Saying, he says, what, you expect me to kill one of our best men, Stilgo? You expect me to chop off my own right arm? So, no, I'm yeah. not doing that. So I'm breaking the rules right away. And I'm going to speak in front of you all. And there's mm. nothing you're going to do about it. And I am the Mardi. And I am the voice from the outer world. I am your leader. Um, like, deal with it. What are you going to do? Do you, like, do you defy me? Do you... Yeah. So it's, it's a massive, massive gamble. And for someone like Timothy Chamelet to pull that off with his tiny little pecker neck. Um, mm. it, it, and he does for me anyway, for me. No, he does. I agree. I worked. agree. He did a really it good worked. job. I almost got a shiver down my spine when, you know, he sort of mm. raises his, his, his Chris knife in the air, which is supposed to be the teeth of worms um, and, and proclaims himself their, their, their leader. It, mm. I didn't think, Oh God, that fell flat. Oh God. Chamelet's not believable in that. No, it works for me. It works. Yeah, I, I think that's it. It's a combination of um, Chalamet, uh, very, really, really good performance, and a really good use of sound mixing. So the audio mixing on this film was was brilliant. So I watched it. I think you you probably did too. I think most people did watch it in IMAX. And most normal IMAX films you would have watched were Christopher Nolan's, probably. And he has an awful, awful history of terrible audio mixing. Where sort of the 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 vocals are, are quiet, but other things are too loud, and it's just a big mess. But they did such a great job with the audio mixing on this. You know, certain points are uh, right at the the perfect level, and then in conjunction with great direction, great cinematography, you see, you know, Chalamet sort of sort of storm in almost, but not. You know, he does sort of storm in, mm. um, and then that uh, the sort of power. Uh, that he exudes from his voice, you know, sort of pulling up one of the Fremen's, like, I know you, you did, you know, your X, Y, and Z. I know you, your X, Y, and Z, you know, I am, blah, blah, blah. Brilliant. Really, really landed. It was it was fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah, no, for me, yeah, absolutely. And I, I hope it did for everyone else. Um, there's a few things they say in, in the book, which they just sort of, again, without a voiceover, you couldn't really do, I suppose. You just have to, if you're going to show and not tell, it would be a mm. difficult thing to do. But it's this thing that Paul is supposed to be, and it's the same theme he's on steroids with his little sister, Aaliyah, St. Aaliyah of the Knife, is that they're a child, but they behave and act and speak like an adult. Okay, mm. at the beginning, he's supposed to be 15 and sort of quite a, a, a weakly little 15, but yet he behaves and speaks and makes decisions as an adult. Mm. And and when as soon as everyone around him, when they realise that, they're all taken aback by it, and and that just goes on on and on and on until, like you say, he's like an eighteen year old, and um, and and uh, again in in the novel, it's all done not with dialogue; it's just the narrator, the omniscient narrator, mm. tells you um, 
that people are, are, are just surprised that the, the the juxtaposition between what he looks like, i.e., an eighteen-year-old, and how he behaves and the amount of authority he exudes from what he says that even Jessica is surprised like mm. quite often, like more than once, quite often surprised. It's like saying, Oh wow. He's just, I've just noticed he's got to a new level of, 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 of shining authority, a type of authority shining out of him. And it's undeniable. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if Chamolet's performance quite reaches that peak. But not far well, off. Not far off, though. It's it's well done. No. Give it. Well, there's me. one piece of dialogue where he shouts at Jessica, which mm. I think takes her aback and is is probably Denise's representation of that, I guess, uh, from the novel. So he shouts at her and says, "You know, that's not. I, I can't remember what it was. That's not hope, wasn't it?" He shouts, "That's not hope." Mm. Uh, and mm. she's like, "Whoa!" You know, it's a visual. I'm okay. Wasn't expecting that. Um, both respect and I don't know, probably a little, maybe a little bit of fear. To be fair, um, I think they did a really good job there. I think that's probably, you know, Denise's visual representation of that. I guess. And also, Paul is supposed to be able to use the Bene Gesserit voice, which mm. has got an almost magical quality to it. Um, but that's another thing about sort of coming of age, isn't it? At some point, you have to say to your parents, "No." Yes, they, yeah, they tell yeah, you something. Correct. They tell you something, or even command you to do something, and you say, "No, mm. that ain't happening. That ain't happening. You're dealing with yeah, a grown-up now." Defiance right. thing, yeah, the sort of yeah. the, the trepidation of uh, reject, re rejecting your parental authority the, the first time, uh, mm. and sort of the ramifications of that. Mm. It, it's it opens the floodgates. From then on, the interaction is completely different because you are. You know, you, you have sort of crossed a, a precipice, haven't you? You have mm -hmm. matured mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm. Um, I hadn't thought of it like that. That's a very interesting way to put it, actually. And and very, very true. Uh, I think mm. that perfectly parallels that. It's like, uh, no, I am an adult in my own right now. And mm. you, you can't tell me, like in Labyrinth with David Bauer, you have no power over me anymore, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a, a, a legitimate sort of autonomous power in my mm. own right and and you you, you yeah. can't treat me as a kid anymore you can request but you can't right. you can't come on. <laughs> right there's a line actually in 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 the novel gene where uh, it, it's from it, it, it's from uh, uh the princess urulan something like uh i can't remember the exact line but it's a, a paraphrase but it's something like um uh, a part of your childhood dies when you realize that your father is merely mortal merely flesh and blood mm. or is 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 fallible um when, when you realize that there's something between your mother and father that you can never be a part of you know quite serious adult things mm. things like that that um that are all part of of growing up or becoming an adult in in some ways um mm. so yeah it's all in there there was one other one other point in the movie which sort of gave me uh a chill down my spine a bit um at the end, the fight scene at the end, at the very end, uh, oh, one difference there is that uh, Fade Ratha stabs Paul, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, he, it's, he sinks a knife right in his torso, doesn't he, in the, in the movie? That doesn't happen yeah. in the book. They both give each other light wounds, very light scratches, mm. uh, and then Paul thrusts a knife through his head. So I think so up under the chin into his brain, I think it says something like that. But but, mm. but Paul doesn't get deeply wounded or stabbed in the book. Anyway, that's different. But anyway, after he wins, which is the same, of course, uh, he sort of requests or demands the hand of the Princess Irulan and um, and basically essentially requests the imperial crown of the emperor, Shaddam IV, Christopher Walken. <laughs> and uh, in the film... Oh, and Jessica gets the nod from the existing uh, uh, Reverend Reverend Mother, um, mm. uh, Gaius Helen. I can't remember her name. Anyway, um, in the film, for me again, it might, might have just been me. Um, it was handled very, very well when Wilkin sort of um, pauses for a moment and then bends the knee, physically bends the knee to to kiss Paul's ju ducal uh, signet ring. Um, and there's some shots of Jessica 
and 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 the reverend mother's reaction and yeah it worked again for me it worked mm. um i know I, I agree i think the only thing that was off put in was the, the the sort of um spoiled child that cheney became in that moment mm. and sort of stormed off that that's the only thing that i would i i i, I think christopher walken did that the the whole the whole performance and interaction really really well i think the direction was was great again the sort of pause and the sort of the sort of reluctant acceptance that he must now do this you know it's very much oh, i don't want to but i'm going to because i have to and and it's almost it's almost accepting that he literally brought this all on himself because if he didn't you know start any of this it would never have occurred mm. he's like okay fine um uh, uh, yeah, handled very, very well. But yeah, the Cheney thing just it it did throw me off. I was like, what? What? Yeah. What? Okay. All right then. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Absolutely right. So Paul sort of insists that he uh, take the princess, uh, or along was it Florence Pugh as his as his consul mm. as his wife, and uh, all the way through the story, he always knew he had to do that if he's going to. Uh, retake his place at uh, the head of one of the great houses of the Landsrad and even be, be the emperor. He's got to marry well. Um, mm. He's kind of got to marry that princess. Um, uh, and so in the book, Chain is sort of okay with that. Or in, in another in another way of putting it is that she just understands that that's the way it's got to be. Mm. And Paul says to her in the novel, um, I, I'll always love you. You're the, the first the first one. You're you're my actual love, but I've got to do this. It's and political, and, and, basically. Yeah, just purely political. Yeah, I, my my actual affections, my actual heart, will never be with her. It'll always be with you. Mm. And Cheney in the novel just gets it, understands that, and doesn't put up a fight and doesn't storm off, doesn't like or anything. And yeah, but in the film, for some reason, they made her be all sort of uppity and pissed yeah. off and weirded out by it all. I don't know why yeah, they well, chose to they do all, that. They, they do include that dialogue. There is words to that effect. Yeah. You know? Just he does beforehand. Say, right? I can't remember what it was, but he does say mm. it is words to that effect. It's the sort of the, you know, whatever comes from here or something like that, I think he said. Um, but she just looks at him like, what? Like, what yeah, are you doing was, now? What? Odd. Like, yeah. yeah, it was odd. It just makes it you, odd. it just makes you um, less... Uh, to em you just empathise much less with Cheney at that point. Oh yeah, well, I did make yeah, it. Yeah, was my reaction. No, no, you're you're completely right. It is interesting that these through through a, a, a bizarre drive because one can you know one can imagine why they chose to do it. It's because you don't want to see a you know a woman be okay with a, a man getting with another woman. I'm I'm assuming. Um, so in an effort to strengthen her character. They make her appear petulant and more unlikable. Mm. You're not Petulance, empathizing with exactly her in that right. moment. You're actually going, uh, but when I mean, this has to, you know, the audience gets it. We understand why it has to happen. But again, they're doing that. The change is doing that to to make her appear, you know, stronger for whatever reason. But it it doesn't it doesn't make you like her in any way. She's mm. not loses all the charm or you know, whatever charm she did have. It's fascinating. I don't know. I always find that fascinating, the changes that they do in an effort to make people more likable. It always backfires. Or, mm -hmm. or, or always backfires. That's one other thing where I think the character of, of uh, Paul Maldib is so great because both in the novel and they do it in the film very well, again, in my opinion, is that he's not perfect. <laughs> Mm. He's, he's absolutely not perfect. You know, nobody, what do they call it? Is it a Mary Sue? Uh, 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 yeah, Mary a, Sue. A, a type yeah. of, you could have, you could have a male Mary Sue. Ga a Gary type, Sue, I think we call it. Oh, really? Is there, I think, I've never heard that before. That's very good. <laughs> Gary, Gary Sue. Sue and Mary Sue. <laughs> he's not a Gary Sue, is he? He's, um, he's flawed. No. He's flawed. And he knows he's flawed. Mm. And he knows well, he goes on a traditional hero's journey as well, mm. you know. He mm -hmm. genuinely goes on a traditional hero's journey. He starts at one point, like he's point A to point B to point C. He has to go through a series of events where his flaws are exposed to the viewer or obviously the reader uh, in the respect of the novel. To uh, For us to even have any level of respect for his end, 
you know, sort of presence that he has. If you didn't go from A to B, you wouldn't you wouldn't respect him at, at C. You just right. wouldn't. Right. But that's lost. That's lost in modern day filmmaking. Generally speaking, uh, we we don't get a hero's journey. And I think that's why, you know, this was rounded out so satisfying because they kept all of that. They kept, as, as you as you rightly say, the the flaws. He is very flawed, and he he's aware of it. Mm. Yeah, aware of it, and also aware that he's powerless to to not be flawed. Right? Mm. It's not like okay, I'm flawed, but at one po- at some point I will be perfect. When when I arrive at point C, I should be perfect at that point, and everyone will mm. love me. No, no, it's never going to happen. You're flawed, and you will remain flawed. <coughs> I mean, well, especially um, okay. especially especially with what what transpires post film in terms of what's going to happen. Right. I said that. Yeah. The, you know. Yeah, struggling as as we all do, I imagine, to more or less degrees, struggling with the fact that we're that we're not perfect, that we make mistakes mm. and are bound to make more mistakes, beating ourselves up about opportunities missed, or, or, or things we know we won't be able to pre- prevent ourselves from doing, which aren't the best decisions, all that sort of stuff. You, you know, like someone. Mm. Luckily, I'm I'm not really um I haven't really got any terrible bad vices, but you know, people that are. Maybe say you're like a heroin addict, and you're you're incapable, you you're, you're you're incapable of weaning yourself off, and you hate yourself for it or something. You could have, so, could have started with something lighter, just a bit of alcohol. You went straight for, for yeah, <laughs> or any addiction which you know is bad. You know it's destroying you yeah. and the people around you, and yet you're powerless to stop it, or you feel yourself mm. powerless to stop it. You know, like a degenerate gambler or something. But that's another, as you, know, as you quite rightly say, that's an how, how this perfectly represents coming of age that's another coming of age and sort of mat- maturity aspect is is self-reflection you know understanding your flaws and your weaknesses and where you sort of sit in the world but you know understanding that we all have those flaws and weaknesses you know it's it's it, a high level of immaturity to simply say well I'm fine don't worry about it and do no sort of introspective thought um, so I, I, th- that's another great example uh, of that sort of coming of age element. It's one of the maladies of our age, if I can get a bit philosophical very briefly. It's one of the maladies of our age that we're told you're perfect. You're yeah. perfect the way you are. Don't worry about the, the fact you're like sort of morbidly obese or something or or, yeah. or, or a degenerate in, it, in all sorts of ways. Don't worry about it because you're perfect. No, you're not. Isn't it? No, you're not. And yeah. furthermore, you probably will never be because no one mm. is really. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the art of characterization is lost in a lot of movies and TVs these days. So a character like Paul is uh, an example of great characterization that he goes through this mm. journey, as you say, and he's not perfect and he knows he's not perfect. And um, but yet still this journey um, um, and that you follow him along the way. And that, you know, some people that are flawed are more appealing. It's more real. Some, something that springs to em- mind. I'm oh, sorry. Mm. I was just going to say, say you have more empathy with people that are flawed. You know, you you, you can you can empathize right. with them because right. we are all flawed. You present right. someone that is just sure fine. You know, they're, they're great. It, it's, it's vacuous. It's empty. You know, you, you, mm. Can't, mm. you can't relate to anyone. That is presented in that way. You just can't. Mm. Yeah, no, it's only one character that springs to mind is Sherlock Holmes. I uh, <laughs> went through a period when I was a bit younger, through my twenties, of um, reading all the Sherlock Holmes stories and watching as many TV and film adaptations as I could. Um, I love the Jeremy Brett ones from the seventies. Anyway, mm. Holmes is sort of. In, in many ways, a, a Mary Sue or a Gary Sue, he's sort of, he's sort of saccharine, sweet, perfect to everything he does and touches and turns to gold. gold. He's, he's, he's brilliant and never mm. fails, except he is actually a degenerate opium fiend. <laughs> yeah. And there's a couple of times, yeah, there's a couple of times, in a, only a couple of times in any of the original Arthur Conan Doyle stories where... Um, it, it's made clear that actually he struggles with dr- drug addiction. 
massively. Mm. Uh, there's one story I can't remember which one it is, but um, 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 uh, Doctor Watson finds him in an opium den, sort of drugged mm. out of his mind, and and pulls him. Uh, uh, anyway, anyway, the point is, is that Holmes is becomes a much richer character, a much more sympathetic character. When you know, in fact, he's he's not perfect. Yeah, he's not. He's far from yeah, no, perfect. Actually, I agree with um, that. Absolutely agree with that. And, but again, um, that's lost. Uh, and I think that that's what they failed to do. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's what they tried to do with Cheney in doing what she would do because people would do that. I guess I, d- I don't know. I'm trying to think of the the sort of mindset. I don't think it is that. I'm, maybe I'm being I'm playing devil's advocate a bit too much, but. But there's yeah, more know. or less there's more or less um, successful ways to go about it, right? Yeah. Uh, the, what they did with Cheney is just to make her petulant. Now, I think that's the perfect word mm. you chose there. It comes yeah. across as as, she just as, off, as petulant, again, like a child. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it was all. Yeah. No, I don't empathise with you. No, I, I'm on board with Paul. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. Well, there's there's so many more things. I, I understand they are going to make a part three. I think they're making a part three. So, oh, I mean, you know, by now that would all, all all but be confirmed. I, I on the lead up to the film's release, they were hammering home if this movie does well, if this movie does well, which generally speaking implies that they've got, you know, uh, they've sort of penciled in the financiers. You know, hey, you know, do. You, can we? Yeah, 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 sort of, you know, but if it hits this sort of margin. Um, and the response has been brilliant to the film. Opening weekend, good, respectable numbers. It's not mind-blowing numbers, but what was absolutely incredible was the drop-off from week one to week two. So the drop-off is what tells you whether a film, you know, is like a one-hit wonder, a little bit of a you know, like a, a, a one-weeker. So a Marvel film is a one-weeker. A Marvel film comes out. If it doesn't make its budget back in its opening weekend, it probably won't because they drop off an average of 60% from box office, you know, first week to second week. Yes, yeah, huge. It's huge. This movie had a drop-off of about 30%, hmm. which is brilliant. It is absolutely brilliant, which means word of mouth is carrying it. Mm. It means people are constantly, you know, talking about it and wanting it to do well and passing it on. And, you know, whether that's a byproduct of the theatres as well, I don't think it is. I think I think a movie like this isn't necessarily doing well is not a, a symptom of a, a dry spell in theatres. And then this movie coming out, it's a symptom of it having very good word of mouth because it's a good film. Mm. I would put it down to that. And so because it's doing well. I would say it's all but confirmed that a third one would be on the way. Not for a while, though, because I think Denis said he's making a f- like two other movies beforehand. Uh, mm. Not that I know what they are, but yeah, the third one would definitely be on the way. But then that's supposedly just Dune Messiah. Do you think that they could do that whole story in one movie? No, that's what I, I thought. I, 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 I wouldn't have thought so. So there are loads of Jude novels, loads. I can't even remember how mm. many there are because Frank Herbert died and then his yeah, son carried on. kept writing them. Yeah. So I actually don't know how many there are, eight or nine or more. I think anyway, it's eight. Off is it, that, I think is, it was eight. The first three are, are sort of the – the first three are sort of – the, the the best the main ones right mm. and if they do it at the same pace as these first two that could be 10 movies or something if they wanted to uh maybe i'm exaggerating slightly but not much the story um keeps getting exponentially bigger uh sort of almost crazily bigger mm. Um, do you think? So, what do you think? That, sorry to interrupt, but do you think yeah. that they could possibly do that in a political, socio-political climate that we're in, especially given the fact that they were very anti stating what it was, which was a jihad? Mm. Do you think that they could do Dune Messiah as it is, story-wise, as a good, worthy adaptation? I think that's a wor- wor- worthwhile question asking. I think they well, they certainly could. Whether they mm. will is something a bit different. I think what they could probably do if they want to just err on the side of caution is just 
uh, not call it a jihad, just use another word. Uh, mm. Maybe if they don't like the word Messiah, call him something else, just keep calling him uh, Lisan al Ghaib or something. Um, mm. They obviously didn't want to use the word Mahdi. They obviously didn't want to use the word jihad. But they could still do it all uh, and just um, sort of change some of the, the, the wording a bit. That's uh, fair. That's fair. But if they are going to go on and do more 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 films, go on and do Dune Messiah or something, um, there would be no way to avoid it. That's that's the whole story. It's a sort of mm. universe-wide or galactic-wide war, a sort of a religious mm. war in Paul's name. Uh, yeah. So there's no way to avoid it. Uh, so, that yeah, that is what it is. <laughs> well, I, oh, yeah, I, I would be down for as many of these as they're willing to make. I'll be very, very happy with this, I think. Me too. Hopefully, my, my hope from from this film, and we've not seen it yet because we're still, the movie industry is still sort of reeling from the strikes. But I'm hoping from this film, other studios begin to green light more sci-fi because that's what tends to happen is that you get, you know, a movie hits, it does well, it's critically and, you know, critically acclaimed, fan acclaimed, box office. And then every studio just copies. It's why we've got multiple bloody movie universes all the time and so many bloody caped films. Um, and, uh, you know, not not to, not to in an effort to sort of copy this, of course, but sci-fi is my, you know, it's, it's my jam. I like sci-fi and I like sort of the sort of high, high concept sci-fi and things like that. So it'd be so good to see more. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it, to, to the betterment of society, less caped stuff would be good. Mm -hmm. No, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree with you. I'd love to see many, many more of these films, as long as they keep the same director and cinematographer, whoever did the cinematography. Uh, I think it was Greg, Greg Freezer. Greg. I've heard the name. Uh, yeah. No, so no, no, whoever, no. whoever sort of uh, the, the, the top dogs in charge of writing, directing, cinematography, if it's the same team or most of the same team, bloody make 10 of them, please. Yes, please. Uh, one yeah, thing I'd Greg, say, Greg Fraser. It was Greg Fraser. Okay, right. Yeah. Well, he's a master of his uh, of his genre. Absolutely, he looks brilliant. On, uh, brilliant. Twenty forty nine. Do uh, yeah, Blade looks Runner brilliant. I think. Yeah, yeah, I thought that looked brilliant. I thought that was written very well. The story was was great. Uh, I was hooked. Essentially, hardly anything to criticize it for. Um, so yeah, I would love to see uh, many more June films. Um, I'd like to see more sort of very, very good sci-fi. One thing I would mm. say about that, though, is I've read lots of sci-fi in my time. Lots and lots of uh, all sorts of things. Philip K. Dick, Asimov, loads of stuff. Lots and lots of, I would say, I, I don't know, dozens of uh, top draw uh, sci-fi, like the most famous sci-fi novels. Um, I, I, got, I downloaded a thing years ago must be 15, maybe 20 years ago, it was someone had got together the top 10, uh, top 100 sci-fi novels on audiobook. Oh, wow. And I listened to well over half of those right off the bat. Mm. Anyway, as I said right at the beginning, for me, oh, and June was number two on that on that particular list. And most lists you look up, June, the first June novel, is right at the top in top 10 in mm. most people's lists. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is... Um, there's a, there's a relatively small uh, bracket of uh, source material that is of June quality. Yeah, yeah. You go down to sort of the top twenty, top fifty sci-fi novels, and they're they're not as good. Yeah, they're not as good. The thing about sci-fi, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but this is my feeling on the matter: is that the best sci-fi is stuff where it doesn't confuse you too much so in mm. june for example he'll come out with uh, a completely fictional thing a completely fictional name for something and concept of something and it's pretty much self-explanatory it's almost mm. self-explanatory lots of sci-fi they don't do that they keep things really they keep you off-footed philip k dick does does that massively he'll reference something again and again and again and it's not clear what it is and he doesn't explain it yeah some, yeah, yeah. some people love that. It makes them feel clever. I don't really like that. <laughs> mm. I like I like sci-fi that's a bit on the slightly on the easier to grasp level of the spectrum. Um, I think most people do. Uh, mm. You don't want to be confused right up until the last page of the book, and then you remain confused forever. 
Some people yeah, like I that. Think, I yeah. don't. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I think sci-fi sci-fi works best when it when it present and movies work best in sci-fi and other sort of formats as well when they present a world which is easily accessible and you can still present things which are futuristic or you know just out there fantastical but it has to be done in a way which is you know has a certain air of uh, tangibility or accessibility to the viewer or the reader so you have to be able to go well this is what it is because it is right you know too many people try to explain too many things like i mean the mentats for instance you know it, 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 human computer like it, it's pretty it's, it's it's pretty quick like it's not it's not like overwinded you know they they take a sort of an energy drink type substance as well cool like a, that that's the the sort of as much understanding as you realistically well, a, a, a spy master you just mentioned once that they're a spy master it's like okay got it go okay yeah yeah exactly Sorry, yeah uh, yeah stuff like that but but hmm. the concept can still be very science fiction hmm. but in an accessible format so i mean that goes right the way across the board i mean it, you know even terminator for instance and alien and things like this it's like oh well this is this you know like, oh okay fine you know <laughs> deep space miners oh okay cool you know it's like a lot of things, a lot of movies tend to have plot holes, but it's whether the movie is entertaining enough for you to overlook those plot holes. And it's the same concept with sci-fi in the regard that it has to be entertaining, accessible enough. Most things have plot holes, but it's whether it presents itself in a way where you can go and start to pick it apart. You know, you become mm. confused with it and you get to think too much about it. I guess it's, it sounds almost a bit ignorant, like you want a film that doesn't make you think, but I don't want to think about the minutiae of why that character is doing, you know, hmm. where he trained to get this weird skill or stuff like that's irrelevant to my enjoyment of who he is and sort of his, his sort of function in this universe. Hmm. Um, hmm. So yeah, I'd agree with you, basically. There's a, there's a balance to be struck, of course, because I and you and people like Drinker and most people that have got a, a brain in their head, we all complain that hmm. modern TV and movies are too dumb and they dumb down oh, and yeah. they tell, don't show and it's all it's all pretty dumb okay mm. and something like jude and june 2 is good because it's not that um mm. and so what i was saying and you agree with me i think uh, was that uh, you can go too far the other way and sci-fi sometimes does uh mm. who was it i was i was listening to an audiobook of something just the other day and it was um oh god i can't remember who it was but it was extremely extremely difficult and they're throwing out name after name of fictional things that they just made up uh and concept after concept after concept and mm. maybe it would be explained further in the novel but it got to such a point where it was like um it, it's like th this book is for people that want to be confused yeah, um, yeah that yeah. want to be off uh, yeah uh, anyway anyway sci-fi is one of those it's a fine it's a fine yeah. balance to strike yeah. between yeah. Yeah. presenting an intelligent an intelligently worked world with concepts which are mature and sort of future you know in a, in a futuristic setting and imaginative and you know new and and uh, rather than sort of cliche and stuff which we've seen time and time again versus I, I guess it's that nuance, isn't it? It's the nuance between being able to present uh, present that, you know, accessible, nice, enjoyable, etc., versus someone who they sort of indulge themselves on mm, self indulgent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, well, it is, isn't it? It becomes the universe itself is the story universe and and the the, the sort of minutia. It, it becomes a self indulgent sort of thrill ride rather than the story itself. I, I, maybe that makes sense or, or doesn't yeah but. no it does yeah a lot of some sci-fi writers <clears throat> are very very self-indulgent yeah yeah they can mm. be and so that's what i would say that that frank herbert and june for me for most people nearly everyone that's ever read it that balance is struck perfectly you know mm. that you're you know that you are in the hands of a master storyteller mm. a master writer I, I, I can't um I, I can't really 
praise well, I'll tell you a great example. one enough. Yeah, sorry. Mm, well, I was just going to say, I'll tell you a great example, right, of someone who could have been very self-indulgent was in his personal life upon manufacturing the world. It's not sci-fi, but it's a great example, actually, to try and sort of, you know, explain my, my sort of thinking on it all, is Tolkien. So Tolkien, incredible storyteller, but also someone that enjoyed the minutiae. You know, he famously created the languages. Mm -hmm. He actually had created the languages that he used in his worlds, created maps, everything. So he knew it inside out, which is great for him when he's fashioning the stories. But it's almost like when you, and, and so that worked perfectly because the stories itself, he knew his universe inside and out. So when he came to write the stories, the viewer, the reader could go along with it in such a way where they believe it because it was so fleshed out nicely. But it's almost as if the sci-fi writers that become too indulgent, they're trying to get you, they're almost fashioning the world as they're writing it along, as opposed to establishing the world beforehand or did, did yeah. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, Arthur C. Clarke is a very great, again, one of the most famous of mm. all time. Nearly everyone agrees Arthur C. Clarke was a genius and master. Uh, but he's mm. very good. I would say uh, someone like Arthur C. Clarke um, or, 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 or Frank Herbert, um, it's a page turner. You, mm. you won't be bored. You won't be sort of wondering, oh, how many, how long is, how long is this scene going to go on for? Anything like that? Because I've actually, it's crazy for me to say to criticize a master like Tolkien. However, I'm going to. <laughs> the, <laughs> have you ever actually read the Lord of the Rings novels? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. Yeah. They're long winded. They well, they they are, and they They're weirdly slow down in certain certain parts as well. <laughs> they are great, and of course, he's a master, and who. who who am I, yeah. some peon, to criticise the great Tolkien? <laughs> uh, a master linguist, uh, a scholar, mm. a master, a master scholar. Um, but they they are long winded. I first tried to read the first Lord of the Rings book when I was quite young. I was like mm. thirteen or something. I couldn't do it. It was it was too much. It was it was it was over my head. It was too long. Uh, I had to wait. I, I was in my early twenties before I picked it up again and could do it. If you know what I mean. Mm. When people claim, "Oh, I read Lord of the Rings when I was ten. no, you didn't. Yeah, no, yeah, you didn't. Yeah. You were. I doubt you were able to. <laughs> they're extremely long-winded and quite difficult and complex. Um, yeah, they're, they're really adult books, to be perfectly honest. Mm. And they and in for for fast swathes of the Lord of the Ring books, it's not what I would call a page turner. It's yeah, going back and back and back agree. into more and more detail about things. Well. Mm. Well, something like Rendezvous with Rama or June, um, it, you will be gripped. If you're any sort of reader, mm. if you've got any sort of imagination, you will be gripped and you won't be able to put it down. Uh, that's Anyway, that's my, my, my thought. <laughs> it's a strong, it. strong recommendation for the book mm, mm. Is, 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 the, is the take home. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will defend Lord of the Rings and, and say... Long-winded, but still a, a bit of a page turner for me. I enjoyed it very much. Back, oh, no, back they're, in the they're, day. They're, just to be clear, they're great. They're nine, nine and a half out of ten books. Of course, uh, yeah. they're just—they're not really—they're not children's books. The oh, Hobbit God, is no. something different. Really? The Hobbit is something different. The Hobbit was one of the first books I ever read, actually, mm. completely on my own, yeah. sort of a, a, a grown-up book <laughs> mm. <laughs> when I was about yeah. ten or something, or eleven or something. Uh, a full book from cover to cover, all on my own. Was the Hobbit, right? Because because that is that well that is a page turner. The Hobbit is absolutely mm. a page turner. It's it's yeah, uh, yeah. if anyone out there, no matter how old you are, if you haven't read the Hobbit, read it, please. Yeah, your, your life yeah. will be second richer. <laughs> yeah, second that, second that. Well, I think that's. Uh, I think that does it, anything further to add? I guess no. I just hope we've being. been able to do it some justice. Uh, <clears throat> Both the novel, the 1984 version and the 2020. We didn't talk about the 84 version. version that much, actually. Not all that honest, much. No, but... no. I mean, no. It, the, the the modern ones are better. Oh, they eclipse it by, yeah, by yeah, a, a absolutely eclipse. My God. It. One one last yeah. thing I would say, uh, which I have already said, so I'm repeating myself. But if you haven't read the book or seen the or seen the films, 
and you're that way inclined, please, please, please do read the book first or listen to it as an audio book. Mm. Then watch the films. The films will be a hundred times richer for you if you do it that way around. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I would say one one tiny defence with the eighty four version because I mean definitely the 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 new ones are substantially more than even tenfold better. But I would say I do enjoy the eighty four one for what it is, and the use of miniatures will always have a special place in my heart. Hmm. Love the use of miniatures. They were <laughs> so good. Although the yeah, the giant pixelated uh, sort of force field that they generate, nah, not so good. Much preferred the new version. <laughs> and it's got Sting in it. What's not to like about oh, Sting? True. Like, you've seen Sting as the Nar Baron. Um, again, if you read the book first, the 1984 version will be pretty good, certainly worth watching. If you mm. don't, it will be weird and won't make sense, and you probably won't like the June universe all that much. <laughs> That's the difference it will make, I think. Yeah, I, I would say watch. Yeah, ma- yeah, what watch the the new ones first. Read the book as well, of course. Once you've done all of that, then go back and watch the eighty four right. one. Yeah, only but then. More curiosity because <laughs> it's mm. it's interesting. <laughs> it's an in, it's interesting of its time and it's interesting. So. Mm. Yeah, that would be my advice. All right. right, Hopefully we've done it justice. I think so. I think so.